There we go. Welcome to the uh, How to Finish uh, bonus session from um, the Idea Explosion Challenge. We're now moving into a new phase of uh, our uh, situation here. And the great news is that... No, that's not right. Where's he gone? Oh, yeah, there he is. <laughs> he is. He's back. <laughs> that was weird. I pressed the thing and you weren't there, even though you were uh, uh, just before. So Luke's back. How are you doing, Luke? I'm back. Uh, you know, getting better. Getting, getting better. Getting better. Good. Excellent. I, I don't think he's 100%, but he's definitely, um, uh, 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 definitely, what did you say? 70%. So. 70. Yeah. Uh, so it's great to see um, everyone here. We've got a lot to get through uh, today. I, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, when you create stuff, um, if you create too much, it actually takes longer to get rid of the stuff than it does not to have created it in the first place. <laughs> so I got up at three o'clock this morning. In fact, I woke up at half past two and I couldn't get back to sleep. But anyway, I lay there for half an hour stressing about needing that extra half an hour. Anyway, I woke up at half past two and then I got up at, at three o'clock um, and I spent the last two hours um, attempting to remove content. But I'm like, no, but this is a really, this is a really important bit. So, uh, so we've got a fair amount to, uh, to get through, but I'm going to try not to um, overwhelm you with uh, massive and 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 just give you what is uh, required because we all need a bit of in our life, don't we? Anyway, so coming back to uh, more serious uh, matters. How to finish more quality music, and also why right now is the best time there's been in my lifetime. Now, I understand that this seems like, I don't know, it's either, you know, for to, to some people, me saying, right now, we need to be finishing as much music as we possibly can and uh, releasing it because right now is the best time there has ever been in my entire life, and I've been making music for... I mean, I had a, I had a break from 25 uh, for, for about eight years um, when I was just uh, coaching people. But let's say I've been in the music industry since 1994, releasing music and working with uh, musicians. And in all of that time, there has never been a better time. And it, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people because obviously the music industry, I'm not saying that the music industry isn't anything other than in serious trouble right now. But actually, that's one of the reasons it's the best time in my lifetime. I've never seen the music industry in such trouble as it has been. And I've, trust me, I've seen it in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so so uh, I've been, uh, I've been uh, on the receiving end many times of the music industry uh, being in trouble. Uh, but that is one of the reasons why it's the best time right now. Anyway, we'll come to that. Because what we're, I'm also going to give you is a roadmap of uh, the creative process, an overarching view of the creative process, and you'll be discovering the areas which common sense tell you to do, but which damage your process and destroy your ideas. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about if you've made music for any length of time, and find out why the biggest opportunity for a music producer I've ever witnessed is right now, if you can make great music consistently, um, which is why I'm giving you the roadmap for the creative process, because uh, it would be frustrating to say, Right now is the best time. If you can make great music consistently, you're going, well, I can't do that. I'm going to show you how to do it. I mean, obviously, it's going to be tricky to show you fully how to do that <laughs> in the time that we have available, which is why I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning and uh, struggled to cut this down uh, to size. Um, but I'm going to do my best, OK? So uh, uh, bear with me. And, I mean, I so strongly believe what I'm saying here that... I had to return to making music. It was almost like I, I couldn't not. Because it was like, like, I've been doing this for so long. Am I going to pass up the opportunity of a lifetime? No. I, I mean, I can't. It would, that would be just, that would be the most idiotic thing uh, ever. Um, and, you know, in, in service of that, I am now, I've just launched a new artist project. Uh, me and my band. Here's my band. This is my band. Um, and um, I'll introduce you to them later. Anyway, so this uh, forced me to return to music, and I've launched a new artist project called Zentor because I want to show it from the ground up, how I'm doing it uh, from uh, the ground up. Uh, and it was supposed to be one track a week, 
but it's turned into one album a week. And I know that also sounds utterly ridiculous, but I'll just, you know, just to kind of, so you don't think I'm going completely mad. Um, it, is a, it is a live album every week. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of creating, I'm, it's, I'm fulfilling a lifelong dream. I'm creating, uh, like writing music in real time kind of thing. Um, but I've only been able to do that using the things that I'm going to share with you uh, today. But I'm so sure of this opportunity that I'm not just, you know, I'm not just saying it and, getting, and asking other people to do it. I'm doing it myself. As is the uh, gentleman above, Arash. Um, you're releasing a, a track a week, aren't you? Yes. yes. Two tracks down. Right, two tracks in. Brilliant. And uh, the gentleman uh, beneath me, uh, Luke, is also doing that, aren't you? Yep. Also, <clears throat> two tracks in. Yeah. In fact, there's a bunch of people uh, uh, doing it, as you'll find out uh, later. So, let's get on to it. So, since uh, the crisis meant that live gigs aren't happening at all, who has had this thought? Let's, let's post in the chat. What's the point making music? Who's had that thought? Has anyone had that thought at any point? since the crisis hit. I definitely have. Yes. Why don't you say, why don't you say some, why, why, what, what was the, when did you have that thought, let's say? It's like, <clears throat> almost like what's the point if we can't do anything now, if we can't tour, what's the point when there is so much content that's coming out on social media? Like, who's going to pay attention to me? Well, it doesn't matter at this point. It's so the game is so saturated. Yeah, you know, it's. I mean, like, obviously, there's going to be some people who don't think that because they just love making music, right? I mean, obviously, the number one point of making music is because we love it. Yeah. Uh, but if I mean, if you're just doing it as a I mean, not just I don't want to use the word just because I don't I, that's not how I see it at all. But if you're doing it as just simply as something that you do in your spare time when you're not working, then you probably wouldn't have had that thought. Right. But if like me, who's been a lifelong, you know, full time uh, uh, musician, it's all about, you know, it's not all about it, but it's, it's, it's uh, making a living doing what I love. Yeah. If it's about that then you may well have had that kind of uh, that kind of a thought right so those who have had that thought what are the reasons that you've had that thought what are the reasons that you've had the thought Uh, some people have commented from the last question that I think relates mm -hmm. with uh, this. Like Subfi says, I see music making sometimes as somewhat of a therapy. Lie Society says, I felt it was more important given what's going on in the world. Um, wow, Silverbeat started streaming free live concerts every day for 200 days. Wow, brilliant. Uh, it's really good. Oh, here we go. Here's one. Andy, sometimes it feels like nobody hears it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time it feels like nobody hears it. Welcome to the life of an artist. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, I mean, that is going to be the majority of your experience, yeah, is, is that, that it will feel like nobody will hit it, uh, hear it, particularly at the beginning, right? Um, here we go. Self-doubt. There's another one. Frustration with how the music comes out. Fear. Colin says, because 2020 uh, happened. Yeah, but why? Why does that mean that it, it's not, you know, you don't want to make music? What's the point in making uh, uh, music? Yeah. Billy says, I keep thinking that the world is going to end. Yeah, I mean, you would, you would think, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm definitely not a Pollyanna uh, with, you know, rosy tinted spectacles on and thinking that rainbows and unicorns are falling from the sky right now. Uh, we, you know, we are going through very, very testing times and the world may well end. I mean, but the world, that was always the case, <laughs> right? Uh, and it depends where you look and for how long, right? So 
it depends where you get your information from and what you you know what you actually pay attention to and there are many many terrible things that are occurring but at the end of the day what you can do about it yeah that there are terrible things occurring do, do we stop or do we move forward how do you fix terrible things occurring and obviously as musicians we can't sort of sort out political situations or a worldwide pandemic but we do have value to deliver don't we we do have ways in which we could help yeah so these are tragic times for the music industry yet again um i mean let me just give you a little uh, background on on uh, my history in the music industry so just very very quick I mean, there's so many so many uh, areas where i mean I, I literally started in 1994 at the high watermark of uh, physical yeah and then over the over the, over my uh, career as a uh, musician the music industry basically was destroyed <laughs> as as it was by the internet yeah so when i released my first ever album which is like you know it was like oh it was a big big thing for me my distributor went bust the week before nice Released my second album. Never guess what happened. What do you reckon happened? Any yeah, guesses? Distributor, distributor went bust. <laughs> so, <laughs> woo yes. And then, uh, and then I was like, do you know what? I'm just going to release my third album with a label, right? Because then they'll have it sorted and I don't need to worry about distributors going bust. Guess what happened when the third album uh, got released? The label went under. Well, <laughs> well, it was close. Basically, the, it was about, like, I don't know, about three weeks. Before, I can't exactly remember when. I can't remember the timeline. But the great financial crash happened. Um, and <laughs> so it was like, it was just, uh, yeah. And uh, it, it was like we weren't sure that, that, that we weren't sure that things were going to come out on time. And in fact, I do, th I, I seem to remember that the because they were an American label that the UK distributor did look like it was going to go bust as well. So um, I've been on the receiving end of, of the of various different ructions in the music industry uh, uh, over my life. But I do have to say that right now it's worse than it's ever been. I mean, just by orders of magnitude. So I'm, in no way am I saying that there isn't a problem here. Okay. So while I'm devastated about the destruction of the music industry, you know, many of my friends are really, really struggling um, at, at the moment. Uh, and it's just just terrible. It's a terrible uh, a situation. I have had exactly the opposite, as other people have, uh, the opposite thought to what's the point. OK, and not just because I mean, it is because of this, because the world needs music, because everyone's at home yeah, and, uh, and things like that. But it, not just that. But it's also, and I'm not sort of jumping up and down for joy. I'm not glad that this has happened when I say what I'm about to say. Yeah, I am not jumping up and down for joy. I'm not happy it's happened. I wish it hadn't have happened. Yeah, but given where we are now, there has never been a better time to make music and build a business around it. There's literally never been a better time. Yeah, I'm somebody who looks at what is happening I mean, I never wasn't always like this, but, but it, you know, in the last 10 years or so, I've developed this. I look at what is happening and then I go, what can I do with this? Not, no, you know, like shaking your fist at reality. You, ha you know, you, you do, the, do it for a bit, yeah, for a little while, you know, maybe five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, but then you get busy, right? What's the alternative? So why have I had this reaction to the destruction of the music industry as we know it? Why do I say that now is the biggest opportunity of my lifetime for an independent music producer? Guesses in the chat. So Colin says, it's really just live music that's struggling. Thing is, when you're talking about independent music, yeah, like independent musicians, that is basically the, bin, the business model of most independent musicians, is gigging and touring. That's where it, what's, what it's based upon. So to say it's really just live music that's struggling is, is kind of, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that is basically what the, the vast majority of the music industry is based upon, yeah, in terms of independent musicians. That's where they make that most of their money. It, I'm not saying it's good. In fact, I've been attempting to change that. 
for, for uh, quite a few years. But that's why I'm saying this. Yeah. So here's a good, here's a good point. It's like a big reset from sa safe knife. David, yes. there are always opportunities for success during times of crisis or great difficulty. Yeah, just do a Google. Just do a Google for businesses which started during a depression or a recession. Now, I understand when you do that, one, one thing you've got to bear in mind is that there is a survivorship bias going on there because there's going to be a bunch of businesses that, that, start, that weren't started, <laughs> that, were also, that failed, that were started during a depression and recession. So don't, yeah, don't kind of go, oh, well, that means that, you know, I'm going to succeed if I start now. N no, it's just, it just shows you that it's possible. Yeah, to start things when things are down. Yeah. Playing field has been nev le leveled. Yes. Um, the field has evened. Absolutely. We'll get to that later. Because of ease of distribution online. Yeah, I mean, in a sense. Thanks, Nut. Uh, in a sense. Uh, but that was true before the crisis. Yeah, so it's not, the crisis hasn't made that happen. Yeah. There we go, there's a good point. Jamie says, everyone is one line and online as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, the entire structures have changed. The gatekeepers have gone. Because it can't get any worse. Well, you see, I used to say things like that, Muff. I used to say things like that, and then 2020 happened. <laughs> So I'm, I'm unwilling to, to say things like that. Yeah, no, I think things could always get worse. <laughs> I think we are, we're, we're very well aware of that now, aren't we? Anyway, what um, I'm going to explain. So, so we're, we're getting close, right? But there's a lot of stuff that I have to cover. Yeah. So I'm going to explain exactly why after I give you the roadmap for the creative process, because honestly, this opportunity I'm talking about is only an opportunity for those who can consistently release quality music. Yeah, I want to be really, really clear about this. This is not a magic button we're talking about here. Yeah, this, this, this is hard. It's not easy. Uh, but this is only an opportunity for those who can consistently release quality music. Bearing in mind, it doesn't have to be... When I say consistently release quality music, it doesn't have to be an album every week. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's... But that might be classed as being foolish. Um, Somebody, somebody said to me once, one of my friends who, you know, uh, quite well known, he was like, you know, a track a week, well, you'll, you'll be flooding the market. You know, isn't that, isn't that too much? Um, um, I have yet to tell him about what's happened recently. <laughs> See what he says about that. <laughs> yeah, if you're not making an album a day, you might as well just quit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, right, anyway. <clears throat> so. Created the uh, roadmap of the creative process, where it came from. 17 years full time with over 350 releases. In releases, I mean remixes and uh, stuff like that as well. Uh, but within that, there was uh, three albums and a bunch of singles under various different uh, uh, names. Um, during that time, I developed, I think fairly understandably, an obsession with why. Why was it that I was totally on fire one day and then literally the next day, completely stuck. I, I just didn't get it. it. It didn't make any, like, it seemed like nothing had changed. And it was even on the same piece of music. Yeah, I was like, oh, this is amazing. And then the next day I come back and like, oh no, I don't know what to do. Yeah, so it was just, I became obsessed with why. And I don't know if you've noticed, but over the last, I mean, probably over, over the last 20 years or so, there's been an explosion in understanding about how the human mind works. So I started getting very obsessed with reading about that. Now, I'm no psychologist, I'm no psychiatrist, I'm, no, you know, I'm, not, I'm not that at all. But I did become obsessed with how we can apply what we now know about the human mind to the creative process. Um, and for the last 10 years, I've coached literally thousands of other people uh, in one-to-one -one sessions, in groups and online, from A-list artists like Claude Von Stroke to aspirist, exp aspiring artists in all genres. Composers, musicians, there's been everything from death metal, hip hop, EDM, minimal, techno, um, just, you know, uh, the works, um, certainly in, in Western uh, music. Um, and 
eight of the, those years, I wasn't making music at all. And I actually think this is a really important part of why I've been able to do what I've been able to do. Why I've been able to notice what I've been able to, to, to notice. Because in leaving the creative process completely, I sold all my equipment, apart from my decks, weirdly. But anyway, so I sold all my equipment and I literally didn't make music for, for eight years. And I just helped people make music and build businesses around it. And that gave me this kind of outside view of the creative process because I wasn't in it. Right. So, so it was like I could look back on what I had done and the mistakes I had made, but also I just had this enormous amount of information and data coming in from lots of different kinds of musicians and music producers. Um, I don't know, I don't know, but I can't think of that many people who have had this kind of an experience. I'm not saying it's a better experience, but is a different kind of experience, which gives me a very particular view of the creative process and also the music business as well. Right. Um, and then since 2018, which was when I started to see this uh, opportunity, um, I started making music again. It literally forced me to start making music again because I had solved the problem of the creative process. I could see people making abs releasing absolutely loads of music in much less time, which was better than they were, what they were making before. Plus, I understood finally in building this coaching business how... I could make it work. I mean, because how it could work as an actual business, a secure and stable business, right? Not dependent on uh, uh, touring. Um, and then when the pandemic happened, essentially, it was even more the case. I was like, well, if this was the case before, it's even more the case, which was why I decided to release a track a week in 2021, which has now turned into an album a week uh, for various different reasons. But, but basically... I decided to release a track a week and have encouraged, possibly foolishly, a bunch of other people, two of them being above me and below me, uh, to uh, do the same. Because I'm sure there's a lot of scepticism out there. Why on earth are you doing this? What's the point? <laughs> but it's like, well, uh, all right, L like, at least we're doing it. We're not just talking about it. We're actually doing it. And if at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, which it will, but if it doesn't work, what 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 is the downside exactly? Okay, so so I mean, Arash, if it doesn't, you know, if you don't at the end of it have a secure and I mean, I don't know what the end of it means, but if you don't have a secure and stable uh, business from the music that you make, that then you make, is that I mean, is that then a failure for you? Absolutely not, because if I look back after a year, fifty-two songs mixed like polished mastered the whole nine that's an incredible catalog like in and of itself yeah already two weeks in i'm like i've learned so much yeah exactly it's like it's fun it's fun doing hard things <laughs> it's like it's like it's yeah yeah we are we're using a result like i want to build a secure and stable business around the music i make yeah so we are focused on a goal, but that's only in order to do the thing that we want to do. Yeah, to, to, to give us a, okay, so this is what we need to do. How, how about you, Luke? Let's say that you don't build a secure and stable business around the music that you're making. How will, you know, how would you feel about this experience, do you think? Uh, definitely good, just because it's like, instead of just being like, I'm just going to think, think around a bunch, I'm like, you know, I'm there's like a public accountability where I'm like talking to people and I'm like, I'm doing this regardless. And we know it might be tough, but I'm just going to figure this out for this year. Um, and already it just like when you have that end date, it just like this Friday, I have to put out a track. Um, it just forces you to think differently. Uh, your time just becomes different it's just automatically just a different uh it really is it's been so amazing how you just see the music differently it's like you just like you just do it you get on with it oh i wish i'd done it i wish i hadn't done a three-month build-up i wish i'd just done it yeah i know yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly why did why did we do it before right so now is here right now is not the place for, for me to talk to you about how i'm making music and all that kind of stuff so i've got another channel for that on the it's mike mundaley channel um and tomorrow, not today, tomorrow I'm going to do a live stream. I think it's an hour, it's at my 6 a.m. So 
35 minutes from now, tomorrow, uh, I'm going to do a live stream, a talking live stream where, because um, on, on the Mike Mundaly channel, I actually live stream me making these albums. Well, when I say making them, kind of performing them in, in real time. So, um, but I'm going to do a talky one where I am uh, tell you how I'm making enough music to release an album week. And the link's in the description. I've also put a link to the Zentor uh, music so far. The first two releases on that uh, profile weren't albums, because that was before I kind of had the which meant I'm now writing the, uh, the al albums. But the, the latest one is one of those uh, albums. So just in case you wanted to check and thought I was talking absolute uh, nonsense, I am actually doing this. Right. Anyway, so coming back to the roadmap, why have a roadmap at all? What's the point? Doesn't it? Doesn't it remove the magic? Robin, doesn't it remove the magic to know how the creative process works? Why not just have fun and follow your instinct? Yeah, because, you know, we've got to have space for the magic to happen. Because when you know how it works, then magic doesn't happen. Isn't that true? Yes. Well, let me tell you this. Or ask you this, in fact. Who's had any of these experiences during the creative process when they're supposed to be having fun? Block, as people call it. And I put it in uh, air quotes because I do not like that word. Anyway, block, overwhelm, frustration, boredom, confusion. Luke, have you ever had any of these experiences in the creative process? No. <laughs> Yes. Um, yes. And how about you, Arash? Of course. Yes. <laughs> All the time. All the time. Um, so let me ask you, uh, good folks, what do you do when you have block, frustration, getting stuck, things like that? What do you do? Yes, we've got lots of yeses coming through. All right, sub fi. Oh, no. Yep, sorry. Hang on. Sorry, I've got the thing. Oh, sub fi. I run into those if my setup is not exactly how I want it. All right, so what happens when something goes wrong with one of the things in your setup? Right, that means that you've, you've actually set up a very, very high bar for yourself in order for your setup to be exactly how you want it. What do you, like, like Luke, let me ask you, if your setup is not exactly how you want it, does that cause you to be stuck, frustrated, bored, or confused anymore? Um, no, I don't think so. Just because I've splurged in so many weird circumstances that I'm just like, I can do this wherever. <laughs> I've yeah. been like intense in rainstorms with my laptop, like you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I th I, I, yeah. So, so, so. I think, but I think that's a, that's very, very common. So, thank you, uh, Subfi. Um, there we go. There we go. So, you like me to read some? Yes, go on. Heto. Says Netflix. Netflix, brilliant. <laughs> yes. Leroy, play a different, completely genre and style. That's a good. Nice that's style. a good. That's a really good. That's a really, really good response. Nice one, Leroy. Nice society. Do the work. Nice. Mr. White, go get a coffee. Mm -hmm. Jake, watch TV. Mm -hmm. Easy. Endlessly procrastinate. Or that was a question. Endlessly procrastinate? <laughs> yes, that's the response. <laughs> oh, the, yeah, no, I mean, I, I've I've done that. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, I'm the world's greatest procrastinator. So, mm -hmm. um, really scribble. Step away for a moment, or just jam. Mm -hmm. Bendu, keep working. Frankie, keep going. Yeah. Uh, so, post so though, you know, just keep working and keep going. If you're not careful, that's just doing the same thing that you were doing before, which can lead to you just getting more and more frustrated. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's like, definitely, I can't remember who it was, what the quote is, but it's like, if you're in hell, keep going. 
right? There is a there is an element to that. If you're going through hell, keep going. That's it. Um, it's, but again, it may well be worth finding a better way to go <laughs> when you're going through hell. Yeah, finding finding a better path to take. Yeah. Because like from the experience of coaching so many different people, I can verify for you that if you've had these experiences that you're not alone and that there's nothing wrong with you at all, literally every musician I've met or worked with, and this was even before coaching, right? When I worked with musicians, so I wasn't helping them because obviously I've got a bias towards people who maybe have difficulties, right? Although a lot of the big uh, artists uh, that, that I work with, they don't specifically have difficulties. They just want to get better, right? So that is another thing. But literally every musician I've met or worked with has the same problems at some point or another, yeah? And I think the reason for this is that because until very recently, we didn't have knowledge of how the human mind works. We didn't have enough knowledge about the human mind, mind works. And I don't think really people really appreciate the revolution that's happened in our understanding of how our grey matter works. And a lot of the things that we do and that are s supposedly best practice are based upon false assumptions that have come from an inaccurate, I mean, not that we have fully accurate knowledge of how the human mind works even now, but, but yeah, a much worse model of how the human mind works. Yeah. So everyone oper operates on this base assumption. The creative process is a mystery. It's a magical force that comes down from us uh, you know, wh whenever it wants to. And sometimes it's here and sometimes it's not. Yeah. So we kind of, in that kind of feeling of uncertainty, well, I don't know how this works. I just make music when I'm in the mood or when I'm inspired, blah, you know, uh, things like that. What we ended up doing is we turn away from this mysterious, magical uncertainty and focus on what we can be certain of. Because as human beings, one of the ways in which the human mind works is that it hates uncertainty it cannot stand it it's a, it's a it's like a survival mechanism if there's likely to be a tiger in the cave over there i'm probably not going to go there even because i'm uncertain that there, you know, there might, might or there might not be i'm going to focus on what i can be certain of yeah so what can we be certain of in terms of the creative process well we obsess about mastering our tools and gear I must have the right setup. It must be right. That is the thing. Yeah, so that's something you can be certain of. It makes complete sense that you would do that, yeah, given how our minds work. We focus on technical stuff, which is by definition more certain. If I turn this EQ up here, it definitely sounds brighter. I tested this. I tested this on my little five-year-old, and I, sa I said to him, is this brighter or yeah is this brighter or is this brighter and now i had to explain what brighter meant <laughs> and, and, and once i'd explained what brighter meant i mean i didn't explain it with the the sound because obviously then it would have said but but uh once i explained what the word meant in fact i think he was about four when i did this um uh, so uh, he said oh no that one's brighter right and so then i asked him uh, which is the better piece of music? And I played him two pieces of music, one which is definitely better than the other, but they were the same kind of music and he doesn't like that kind of music, right? So it was a test and he had no idea, right? It's a much easier question to answer. Is this brighter? Can I hear that more clearly than is this good? Is this better, right? So that's why we are so obsessed with all of that kind of stuff. But what about the ultimate bit of gear? What is the ultimate bit of gear? Our mind. How about the tool of all tools? One tool to rule them all. Our creative process. So we've just completed the idea explosion challenge uh, for another round. The idea of explosion challenge competition and you now on the call uh, on the session today we have a bunch of people who probably didn't do the idea of explosion challenge so i'm just going to ask this question to the idea of explosion challengers okay how different is your creative process now you've learned to splurge okay and splurging is one of the different ways i uh, teach people that we teach people to make music how different is your creative process 
Now you've learned to splurge. James says, the best answer ever. <laughs> Maracas. <laughs> Sorry, I just have to... Uh... <laughs> My creative process is now Maracas, whereas before it was no Maracas. Brilliant. So... MDA09JA, total 180. You can read it out a few more, uh, Arnash, if you want to. I keep on, yeah. I keep on taking your Spencer. job from you. It's all good. Spencer, faster. Muff, I'm not sure I had a creative process before. LOL. <laughs> uh, uh, Colin, I can sit down with any amount of time and blast something out. That's great. Wow, that's just so great, Colin. Fantastic. Yes, but have you got maracas? That's what I want to know. Hmm? 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 <laughs> what about maracas? I'm going to have to put that into the automatic music machine. It's going to have to be a whole maraca uh, uh, thing. Anyway, so. <laughs> has to be. Vendu, faster. Uh, life society, radically different. Uh, nuts, it's more refined, simpler. Sidjas. I don't know if that's 1 million or 10 million 10 percent million different. A lot. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> James, uh, totally different. It's about 20 times faster. Billy Scribble, more to the point. Roe, hugely different. B Mono, unrecognizable. <laughs> Max, way more consistent. Girly Co, in a word, lighter. Great. All right. So, so uh, now I'm going to ask the... Uh, the leapers and the leapers are the people who have done the um, full automatic music machine kind of uh, training. Um, and I can see there's a few in there. There's not 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 absolutely uh, loads, but there's a few. So uh, leapers, if you could um, answer these questions, and I'll ask you as well, our Russian loop. Uh, what difference has practicing the automatic music machine made in your creative process? And bear in mind, the automatic music machine is systematizing the process. It's it's actually it, it's like it's the, almost like anathema to a lot of creative types because a lot of, oh, you know, you're, 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 you're ruining the magic, right? It's like thinking about systems and doing things, you know, having particular things that you do at a particular point. See, I mean, it was for me. It seemed to me like it was a really, it would kill the magic. It would stop me from being creative because I was just like, you know, I was just oh, doing all of this stuff and I was just like when something hits me I'm just gonna woo yeah and I'm I'm just creative man uh, and so it was kind of anathema to me it was against, it was against everything I kind of felt that like I stood for it was a sort of identity thing if you like but Arnash for you what what is what difference is practicing the automatic music machine made to your creative processes right nine day difference the sessions are faster I less concerned about the minute details of getting this one particular track perfect now i'm like okay well let's just do it and then if it doesn't work then on to the next one no big deal i think I've, there's less emotional attachment to the tracks which allows me to get even uh more creative freedom now, i don't know if that's like a, a counterintuitive thing uh but by by knowing that i have the capability to make anything i want at any time and not worry about the outcome it oddly frees me up to just do anything. Absolutely, because you think having less emotional attachment to each track will make them worse and is a bad thing. But actually, it's the opposite way around. It means you second guess yourself less, you don't ruin them, you, 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 there's not so much pressure on your process. You can be more relaxed, you can have more fun, you can be more experimental, you can try different things without there being this, oh no, I'm a failure. Everything I do is terrible. I'm awful. I'm a bad person. Oh, no. I think I'm just going to go and watch Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> so let's have a look, see if we can find any leapers uh, in here. Um, okay. Here we go. Son of a Preacher. I love it. It's visual, trackable, organized, methodological, and helps enormously. Yeah. Costals. I'm more excited to work on my music. My mind is lighter because it's all organized. I finish tracks faster in less efforts. Heto, for me, the fun came back. Brilliant. It drew so many questions, doubt, uncertainty away, but it took me a long time. Yeah, I mean, it does take a long time. Yeah. 
Ro, it feels doable. I feel like things are organized enough for me to get more creative when I have time versus taking forever to figure out where I left off on a track before the leap. Um, safe knife. It's become an organized daily routine. This has become my everyday practice and a lot of overthinking with most of the starting tasks have gone forever. Okay, so as you can see, process it, like, like actually understanding how the creative process works allows you to be more creative. It gives you the space to, for the magic to happen. It increases the amount of magic that occurs. I need a magic sound. Ring! I need it, how about that? There we go. It increases the amount of magic that actually happens, yeah? And these methods work because they take into account what we know about how the human mind works, okay? I mean, how useful would it be to understand why you're stuck and know exactly what to do to get unstuck? It'd be pretty useful, right? So, let's get to the basic uh, roadmap. And this requires that I do a little bit of a one of these. Whoop. Oh, there we go. Sorry, that's an old one. Okay. So, there we go. Brilliant. So, obviously, every idea, everything that we make starts from nothing. The blank canvas. Yeah? I don't know what this is. Yeah? So you've got literally uh, nothing. Okay? Um, and obviously, sometimes, not always, you have an idea and people who think they need an idea in order to make something will probably wait for this to happen. But as we know, anyone who has splurged, you don't actually need to have an idea, <laughs> right? Because where do ideas come from, Arash? The ether. <laughs> <Fuck it. laughs> They're magical. Where do cut? Where? Let, let me ask. Let me ask. Let me ask Luke. Where do ideas come from? Um, the brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they come from the brain. But where can the brain get ideas from? Uh, past experiences. Right. And what um, is a what? What is a version like? Like past experiences, including. Uh, other music you like right but also including so if you think the past is literally one second ago so you'll go into the studio without an idea <laughs> you go into the studio without an idea oh, I've, got, I've got no ideas I'm totally uninspired I'm totally not in the mood and then you just fall on the piano like that <laughs> ah! I just heard something. That gives me an idea. Right? Uh, so Past experiences includes what's just happened in the creative process. I yeah, push so a button, I hear a sound. Oh, that gives me an idea. Ah, if you're open to it, right? Right. Because really all previous. of your ideas, they, they, it's like they, they, they come from your past experiences, including the ones that just happened 30 seconds ago, five seconds ago. Yep. So you don't need an idea in order to make music. You don't need to be inspired in order to make music. You don't need to be in the mood to make music. You don't even need an idea. Did I already say that? Probably. Anyway. All you need to do is make music. So let's get on to that bit. So this is the bit that the idea explosion is. Uh, a idea explosion challenges the idea explosionists. That's the one I was thinking of. The idea explosionists already know about. Because what you do is you just go, Bleh. <laughs> right? You throw the clay on the wheel. This is uh, yeah, so that you have something which gives you an idea. So all right, so now I have something. It might be good, it might be bad, but it is something. You know, if something is bad. That doesn't matter if you have a good idea as a result of it. You know, people often go, oh, I don't want to make anything bad because I don't want to waste time. But if you agree with me, and I can't see how you wouldn't, 
if you agree with me that ideas come from your past experiences, including the thing that's just happened, then all that, all that really matters is the idea that you have about the idea. I mean, not all that matters. Obviously, if you already have a good idea, that's good as well. I mean, already have a good thing coming out, that's, that's good too. But really, there's also the idea that you have about an idea. Oh, that's terrible. But I tell you what, that gives me an idea. Right, now you're, you're inspired. Yeah, inspired doesn't always mean it already is good. Inspired means you know what to do next, surely. Which is why we splurge. So you, you, you know about that, okay? So we splurge in order to come up with more ideas, to have ideas about ideas, as well as create ideas themselves. Now, the reason that this diagram, and by the way, this is a, uh, this is a, a diagram I share uh, in uh, the leap. The reason this diagram has these lines going out like this, yeah, is that the start of the creative process, this is really, really, really important. The start of the creative process any creative process, effective, a healthy creative process, has to be divergent. It has to go out. You are, you are increasing the number of options that you have. Now, obviously, if you do overdo it, you can just end up getting completely overwhelmed. Right? But, but generally, you are letting go. You're not, you're not improving yet. You're just seeing what there is. It's like brainstorming. You go... <laughs> yeah, you're just letting it all out. You don't have to, it doesn't have to, like, it, in fact, the more bad ideas that you can let out, the more likely you are to have good ones. Why is that? Why is it that, why do you think, in fact, post in the chat, why do you think it is that the more bad ideas you have, the more likely you are to have good ones? Why do you think it is, Arash? That, that I see you've been posting in the chat. In fact, let me ask Luke. Luke, why is it that the, the more bad ideas you have, the more likely you are to have good ones? Um, because you're getting more information about music in general. So you're understanding different things that can work and can't work. Um, and like, if you go to try something and you want a certain thing to happen and it doesn't, then that's getting information. You know, your or information, that's really knowledge, um, like where you're actually learning, you know, what works and what doesn't by trying it. Um, and sometimes when something doesn't work, then you iterate on it and you iterate it a few times. It ends up like uh, it ends up working. And I've seen that in my own like splurges, you know, when you, you listen to like 30 or 40, it's like 10 of them will be bad. And then there's like four that are good um, in a row. And it's like you tried all these things and it's like you were working on something and then out of nowhere, it kind of like coalesces and you figure it out and then you get bored and so you move on to the next thing. Um, and you just keep doing that and doing that and it's just like slowly but surely you're learning about music by actually making the music versus just reading about it. So all these bad ideas become the foundation of your good ideas. Yeah. So... Um, exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, so, so uh, which is why I asked you. Um, so, well done. Question. Yes. A, a thought came up to me for me as Luke, you're speaking, and then you you posted. Somebody posted. It's a numbers game, or a roll of the dice game of odds. Mm -hmm. I used to think the same thing, but I think there's a connection here because then that just says like everybody with bad tracks will eventually come to a hit, which kind of I think there's a lot of there's a lot more factors that are involved with it but the more you do what Luke was saying the more knowledge you have so it's a game of numbers because as you continue to work in high quantity quality eventually develops and so it's not just an odds thing I think people tend to like well, it's just a numbers game. I mean, it, there is, so there is that mm -hmm. element. I, th I think you're absolutely right. So it's both. It's both. But mm -hmm. and I think some pe sometimes people make make the um, mistake of, of what they're comparing 
what they're doing too. So for instance, when I talk about people uh, who have you know, had great success in the leap, often I'll get a kind of snarky email from someone going, well, you know, play me some of their music, you know, because they've made loads of music in a short amount of time. Let's hear their music. Not, they don't say, let's hear their music before and their music after. They say, let's hear their music now, as if, but that doesn't, that's meaningless because it's about the progress that they have made from where they were before. This is the music they made when they spent an, a year making it, and this is the music they made when they spent a week making it, or, or less. Yeah, that is what they want to be asked. What these, the snarky people want to be asking? Let's hear their music. Yeah, it's like it's like, but they don't. They just go, let's hear their music, right? So it's not that by playing the numbers game you're going to randomly get a hit. Yeah, but. By playing the numbers game, you are going to come up with better ideas just because by accident sometimes. So there is that element to it. But also it is that by doing something over and over again and actually getting into the process of, 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 of um, practicing and trying different things, then you know what it is that you, I mean, you learn so much about yourself, what you're good at, what you're not so good at. So you start removing the things you're not so good at and start focusing on the things you are good at, the things that you love to do, the things that tend to reliably work. You're, you're gathering so much more information that the quality also improves as well. So it's not that it isn't a numbers game, but it's not that it's only a numbers game. It's, yeah. it's, you're absolutely right to, 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 point, that, to point that out. But, but for people who are just starting out, Think of it as a numbers game, because it is as well. Yeah, it's almost like there isn't a downside. Yeah, once you can get over your own darn self, <laughs> and, and which we all have to do. Yeah, yeah, and and just like say, look, the majority of stuff I'm going to make is going to be rubbish. Learn to laugh at yourself about that. You, you, you're going to unlock a whole, you know, a whole thing. Um, so, oh. so yeah. Oh, Mike, I was going to say, uh, Robin asked a question, uh, Robin of Bloopsley um, said, that's the divergent bit, totally agree, but the initial spark, where does that come from? Um, and do you remember that Ravel quote I shared with you? Um, I, I found it and I kind of wanted to read it because it's just like perfect for that. Um, do you care if I do that? Please, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so, so Ravel said, I don't have ideas to begin with, nothing forces itself on me. And then he was being interviewed and he said, the interviewer said, but if there's no beginning, how do you follow it all up? What do you write down, first of all? And then he said, a note at random, then a second one, and sometimes a third. I then see what results I get by contrasting, combining, and separating them. From these various experiments there are always conclusions to be drawn. I explore the contents and developments of these. These half-formed ideas are built up automatically. I then range and order them like a mason building a wall. As you see, there's nothing mysterious or secret in all this. So it's really just like you just put something out and then you put something against it and you say, what does that mean? And then yeah. you try some different things. Yeah, I, Robin, I don't know whether you heard what I said before about <laughs> where ideas come from, our past experience, including the thing that has just happened. That's your answer right there. Where do ideas come from? Another idea. It doesn't need to be a good one. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I've got the, the keyboard. You probably can't see it, but I've got a keyboard over here. Right. If you are open to it, if you listen to it, if you use discovery, I could literally, I mean, I've got the t-shirt on. The chimp, yeah? Automatic music machine, the chimp, yeah? Is that an idea, a good idea doesn't have to come from an intentionally good idea that has, you know, it's like, it's a mistake to think that these ideas are ours, really. They're, they're, the universes, I don't want to get a woo on us, but the, the, the universes, they come from else, that, that they come from other ideas that somebody else has created, from the music that we've heard before, from an inspiring thing that we've heard, maybe just from the butcher bird out here, sings this beautiful uh, 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 tune. In fact, uh, my wife is starting to turn into a bit of a Mrs. Doolittle, uh, and she's starting to... <laughs> and, and this little bird comes and... <laughs> comes and uh, sits and they have this little conversation. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, uh, but having said that, this weekend, there was a monster from, uh, from, the, uh, from the dinosaur times in my uh, oldest son's bedroom. It was, 
it was a, a centipede. Have you seen a centipede like this big? My God, they are vicious. They, they bite and, uh, and they, they can like, they've got a nasty, a nasty bite. It was really aggressive. <laughs> like, so yeah, yeah, anyway. So, but if they come, these ideas come from, from uh, wherever. Yeah, in a sense, they're not ours. Yeah, it's like you're, if you think that you are creating the idea yourself, yeah, it, then it's like, it's almost like you're putting yourself at the center of the, of the creative process. You, you're a participant in the creative process more than being the supreme being in it. Um, anyway, so, so you, you create, you know, you, you've got to think divergently, open. Yeah, it's like you're putting the accelerator on. And part of this, so you've got this thing now. The next stage is what I call discovery, where you, where you, so you've got an idea. Yeah, and even with ideas where you think it's fully formed, that in your head, that is actually a mistake, I think. It's like you don't actually know, you may think you do, but you don't know how it's going to work. You don't really know what it is. Yeah. And the kind of questions that you want to be asking when you get to this stage, and this is still in the divergent uh, stage of the creative process, is what does this want to be? Now, I phrase that in a very particular way. It's not, well, not what do I want it to be, yeah, but what does this want to be? What does the idea itself want to be? Now, I'm not quite as uh, woo as Elizabeth uh, Gilbert, uh, the uh, novelist who's great actually I think you know I think she's absolutely great she's written a great book called Big Magic which I find myself nodding furiously to uh, very often but she sort of takes it to the next level where she does actually think that ideas are I think she thinks that they're living beings or something but anyway but 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 aside from that which I think is a bit too far for me anyway um it's like they do have a life of their own has anyone ever had the experience of trying to get this idea to do something that just feels like it doesn't want to do. Have you, have you ever had that, Arash? Yes. It's almost like you've got this idea. Can you sit forward a bit? You're a bit away from the mic. Yeah, yeah so, so, so it's, it's like you feel like it, it oh, I, I want it to be this, I want it to be this, and you just won't do it. It keeps on coming back to what it kind of already was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like, it's sort of like you're you're pushing it in a certain direction, but it's just better, as it sort of has its own life. It's a bit like when actors talk about um, talk about their characters that they're playing as actual people. It's a bit like that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Or, or novelists. That, yeah. Yeah. There's mm. there's things that you can't necessarily you. I remember a track that I was collaborating on with somebody. We literally did like five different versions of it and it just, we had to drop it because it just did not come out the way we intended it to. And it was fine. Haven't figured out what else to do with it. At this yeah, point. But, but, may some, but maybe what it actually wants to be is good. I mean, that's one of the things we have to, we, we, we want to recognize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So really, if you want to have a healthy creative process, and this is one of the things I mean by non-attachment yeah is that we don't want to be too attached about what we want the idea to be and it's another reason for expanding the number of ideas we have because if we want to do a certain thing then this is an element of rolling the dice where a lot of ideas just aren't going to be that thing so how do we find more do we try and bash this thing into submission i'm sure people have uh, had that experience of beating a beating an idea into submission or do we simply keep making ideas until one presents itself which is the thing that you want this is the difference between when well, really the difference between it's like I'm, I'm talking about an element of curation in your creative process we think that we must create and we fashion everything and we kind of hew the rock yeah and that's all we do but what we also do is we choose. We choose certain ideas over others. Yeah? Um, and if you don't know what the idea actually wants to be, in discovery, you find out what it wants to be. You're literally discovering what it wants to be. 
And at this stage of the process, you are essentially still in that very splurgy mindset, which is zero focus on quality. I mean, you kind of are all the way through, but it, it's very much just trying stuff. So you have an initial idea, yeah, which is a splurge. So you got the you got the sound file. You listen to it outside of the process, and you go, okay, what does this want to be? If you don't know. What do you do at that point, Luke, if you don't know what it wants to be? Which is pretty much most of the time, for, for, for me anyway. Uh, keep throwing paint. <laughs> right, but what does keep... So let's get specific for people so they can really kind of understand. So let's, let's get ourselves into the mindset, or not the mindset, the position of somebody who's just completed the Idea Explosion Challenge, yeah, and they want to understand what to do in discovery right so they've got this splurge they decided they want to work on it and then they listen to it in order to make a list of things to try mm -hmm. yeah what what information do they need to get clear on what to do at that point what information do they need yeah what can you tell them to to oh uh it's kind of just like splurging again just like you know you have these little diving boards right almost that are like well i could try uh i could try making this this techno track into a rock track and then you try that um and you just do it with the same lack of concern um and kind of see like what is this idea like is the thing that's in this track is it is it a melody um is this track really a a, a story um, is it more of just like a groove? Um, is it, you know, it could be any number of things. And and the more you kind of like refashion it and see it from different angles and just do more to it, um, the more information you get about what it could be. And it is just kind of like this, like, I don't know, it's, I'm sure the more you make music, the more you, uh, this happens to you, but it just kind of like, there it is. And it's like, this is a polka track. Um, <laughs> and, and it could be like, and sometimes it's not what you, uh, you want it to be. Um, in which case, like, in which case you can move it to the sketchbook, right? If, if, if you don't yeah. want to work on it, then you can always move these things to sketchbook. Not immediately after the session. Never. You always complete the session, export the thing and don't listen to it a few, few days. And then you make the decision whether to move it to the sketchbook or not. If it doesn't be, if it's not what you want to do. Yeah. But essentially what you're doing in the, after the listening session, when you're thinking about what I'm going to try, you don't have to know that it's going to work. You really don't. You don't have to worry about whether it's going to work or not. And by the way, Arash, can you keep your eye on the, the, uh, the uh, chat for, for any uh, questions? Uh, what, sort of not any questions, because there may be a lot, but, but some questions that might be kind of uh, relevant. So... So it, you don't even need to have a good idea. Again, remember, remember this bit here. You don't even need to have a good idea. You just need to think of something to try. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to know that it's going to work. You don't have to know that it's going to be a good idea. You just need to think of something to try. So you go, OK, I'm going to try, I don't know, adding a baseline here. Or I'm going to try and a whole, not, whole other section. I mean, there are specific uh, games that I uh, give you in The Leap, for instance, in Discovery, and there are specific things that you, you can do. But essentially, all they are is, you know, if you don't want to make the commitment of doing The Leap, which is absolutely fine, then just understand that all you need to do is just think of some things to try. <laughs> it's as simple as that, really. Um, I mean, there are specific games that you can play which will are likely to bring better results, which increase contrast that kind of kind of double down on your style. But it's a very similar kind of a process to kind of thinking of rules for your splurge template. Right. So there's that's, a couple of questions. Yep. So uh, Robin, well, I'll get to that one. Bendu asked, what is an example answer to the question, what does this want to be? Well, 
I don't, uh, I mean, when I say, what does this want to be? Okay, so, so, so I could say, what does this want to be? I go, oh, I know, I know, I know what this wants to be. It wants to uh, be a track where I am um, expressing the love for my children. Yeah, or this wants to be a, a piece of music where I'm, uh, where I'm playing around with people's uh, expectations or this wants to be a track that really really doubles that or you can, can be much more clear than that this wants to be a a track which is highly you know two, it's got two contrasting sections and basically goes a b a b a b there's a different various different um uh, answers to that question essentially w w what we're lo really looking for is the the purpose of the track if you like yeah um I mean, and sometimes more than that, yeah? So it could be, well, the purpose of this track is to make someone dance. So for instance, if you're making like techno, it's, it's to make someone dance in a, in a sweaty club. But so there wants to be a further purpose than that because presumably all your music is, is, it has that purpose. But it's almost like I, you know, the purpose of this uh, track is to uh, make people dance, but do it in a way where, it kind of it's unexpected or like to develop this particular one idea or you know that th th there's a number of different kind of answers to uh, that question it's almost like there is um what i've noticed there's like an aha moment that i have at some point where i'm like oh i know what this wants to be i get it i know what well, i know where this is going i know the thing I, it's like it's like it's it's sort of it all makes sense Ah, yeah, I get it. It wants to be this. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Robin of Loopsley asks, so shouldn't we all be asking ourselves, how can we create an environment which will help our ideas to arrive? For example, help our magic to happen? Yes. This is it, Robin. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what we're doing. Yes. Uh, B. Mono asks, if the track is of a certain genre, do we change it or just go with it? Well, if it, I mean, if it wants, if it wants to be in that genre, then no. If, if you feel that it wants to be something else, then yes. <laughs> I mean, you could try it and see. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you won't know. So, so again, this is about experimentation. But you do it intentionally, so you, you decide, right, I'm going to see what this is like changing it from, you know, country and western to hip-hop. And then you get Old Town Road. So. <laughs> yeah. Nov, Nov Shemesh asks, what if I listened to the ideas and found that there are about 15 tracks I wanted to continue, and now I'm, again, kind of lost in the discovery phase of it? Right, so that's, that's a, great, that's a great, uh, great question. So... First of all, you got to know you, you got to know how much bandwidth you have. So you don't like so the automatic music machine is about finishing multiple pieces of music at the same time. But but particularly if you're new to this, trying to finish 15 at the same time might be over over egging the pudding, shall we say? It might, it might be too much for you. It might be too overwhelming. Okay. So what I would first thing I would do, uh, Nov, is um, reduce it to maybe four. Right. That the four that you are most excited about right now is a good way of doing it. Yeah. And then do four short discovery sessions. Sorry, one discovery session on each of those four. Yeah. Maybe like make a list for each of those four tracks. All right. I'm going to try, you know, and, and in that list, you've got three things that you're going to try. I'm going to try this for this one. I'm going to try this for that one. These three things for that one. I'm going to try these three things for that one. I'm going to try these three things for that one. Set a timer. Half an hour, an hour, 45 minutes, yeah? And just try those three things and leave the things that you've tried. Don't kind of mess around uh, sort of trying to make it brilliant. Just splurge it, yeah? Splurge it, export them, and then leave it a little while and, you know, go, uh, I mean, you can do this on successive days, say. Say you've got an hour a day. So you can do track one on day one, track two on day two, track three on day three, track four on day four, and then you're back to track one again, yeah? Um, and then you listen and you go, okay, so do I know what this wants to be? And if you do, go on to the next stage, which we'll come to uh, in a second. But any, any other questions around this at the moment? 
Nordic Beats asks, wouldn't you get bored splurging if you use a template? <laughs> if, if what? I didn't hear that last bit. If you use a template. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Uh, that's the best answer to the question I can give you. <laughs> I, I I get bored. I will get. I will get bored. I mean, yeah. I mean, yes. You can get. You can sort of start to feel that you want to change things. In which case, what's the solution? Change the template. Yeah. I mean, you don't. You know. And, and also, just change it a bit. Just change one of the things rather than all of them. I can, t I can tell you what gets me more bored than anything else is when I've got unlimited options and I can do anything at any point. That, that, it's like, that's nothing. That's like doing nothing. Everything is nothing. Yeah. At the moment, when I'm making music, and this is how I'm, this is one of the things I'm going to share on the uh, uh, live stream. Ha I'm making my music with just these three machines and what I'm playing on the piano. So there's a piano sound, there's a, a, kind of Vangelis-like string sound, and there are these three machines. And that is it. Am I bored? Not right now, for sure. I'm, I'm like massively excited because of the limitations. I think what might be behind that question is a misunderstanding of where creati creativity lives. It lives in limitations. Yeah, it, yeah. Th that's where it kind of really thrives, is when you are limited. Yeah, I feel like when you're bored with a template, it's almost like a like a prequel for like that's when that's when it's time to like really Double stick down. with the template. Yeah, exactly. Because it, that's when it's like there's a new thing coming because I'm like I've been thinking like the same things so much that I I have to think of a new thing to like get rid of the boredom. Yeah, and that's exactly. when the uh, exactly it's like it's almost like one of the things that so when we do a hundred splurge it's like we do a hundred splurge challenge sometimes i i do it sometimes and uh one of the purposes of it is to make you bored of what you're doing because then you've got to you've got to fill that gap you've got to do something different yeah which is a which is a motivation yeah we're, we're, like i actually it's one of the things i do with uh, my children well it's what i don't do with my children is that i let them be bored because I, t I can tell you what happens. So I've got four little boys. The, the oldest is 10. Um, and they kind of start mooning about. <laughs> I'm like, I just, we, we don't try and fill that hole. We just let them be bored. Because I can tell you what, about 15 minutes later, they're running around the house using their imagination, doing some kind of creative game. Because they were bored. Yeah, boredom is actually a great, is actually a great, tool to to kind of get us to the next uh, stage okay so i'm going to move i'm just going to move on uh, now into draft so we now know what it wants to be <clears throat> okay we or at least we have a good idea of what it wants to be and draft is basically where we are drafting we are creating a draft of the thing that that you know uh, uh, of the thing that it wants to be so so for instance if i say I want to make a, what this wants to be is a piece of music which kind of uh, is highly contrasting. It's got two contrasting sections and it's going to have a structure A, B, A, B, A, B. Yeah, and A and B are the two contrasting sections. What I do is I then draft that out onto the screen. Yeah, again, without too much focus on quality because you're just making a draft. Yeah. So if we zoom out of the creative process and we look here, uh, can you see that? Yeah, we're go now going in. So now what we are doing is we are reducing the number of options. We have less options at this point. Yeah. So we're actually saying, OK, now I have an idea of what this wants to be. So that means rejecting some things that we may like and that we've put in, into it. So drafting is often about removing, is often about improving as well. Yeah. So, but we do still in the creative process, focus, sort of let go of the need for it to be good. But when we are listening to the piece of music in order to make the lists, 
we are thinking, well, what will make it good? So we're not, re we're not removing quality from the equation. We're just applying it when we're listening to it and thinking about what to do next. Okay? So, I mean, drafting often means laying things out, you know, sort of arranging it uh, properly. It can mean a little bit of mixing. It can mean a little bit of, you know, tweaking and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but again, in the creative process, like when we're actually doing it, we're not too focused on whether what we are doing is good. We're simply doing what we have decided to do when we were listening to it. Yeah. Okay. So are there any questions about drafting? No. Great. Okay. Um, ooh, hang on. So now I might have to move my screen over. There we go. Now, so at some point we have bashed this thing into a bit of a sh in, into a, a shape of some kind, okay, and this is the bit that is quite unusual, in that done in the context of the automatic music machine is a in progress thing. Now the, the where this came from is that I don't know if you've noticed it, but you know where I've said that context is everything and that actually wait. So for instance, when you play a piece of music for the first time to someone else, it sounds different. Or when you play it from an audio file rather than out the door, it sounds different. Or when you, when you play it somewhere else, it sounds different because, because there's a different sort of, it's a different context. One of the different contexts that there is, is saying something's done. Yeah, it's like it's almost like every time I go, all right, that's finished, and then I'd hear it like an, on the next day, and because I'd said to myself it was finished, I heard different things. Yeah. So, what we actually do once we've got it into some kind of shape is that we get it into done, and it's done enough to decide if you want to release it. Yeah, because we don't actually release everything that we get into done. Yeah. And done can mean, all right, so this is what it wants to be, yeah? Or it can also mean I'm done with this, yeah? So if it, it, you know, usually you would find that if you do want to release it, that is the, that is the kind of thing you would say to yourself. Whereas I'm done with this, yeah, that's if you don't want to release it. <laughs> that's usually what, you know, usually what happens. Now the whole idea that you would work on music that you don't want to release can seem like alien to some people. But Luke, what kind of a difference is that, just that one insight, that one realization, or that one change in the way that you're doing things uh, made to your creative process? Well, you're looking at it, you're not like bringing in the weight of like, what is everybody gonna think of this? You're just like looking at this thing that you're making making it based on the the ideas that you've made or that you've decided about it um and and just getting it to the point where it is it is done and it's what it wants to be it's like it's a difference between like making a chair you know you're just making a chair that is like meant to be sit in sat in and it's not quite the same but it is like you know music you're making it to what it wants to be and if you're thinking about like do i want to show this to the world you're bringing in all these other questions like what will people think is this a good piece of like branding or something you know all these other uh all these other mental games that um can like prevent you from sitting down because you put all this weight on it and when you get to the point where you're just like making you're just making these like pieces of music almost like they're pieces of furniture that have a purpose and then you're later deciding like okay do i want to show this to people is this something that um, that, that would work. And, and you're able to just sit down and just, you know, carve away at it, um, add to it, not have that like fear of like judgment that can come in. Um, and, yeah. and yeah, just move forward with it. That's, yeah, that's exactly it. It takes the pressure off. It takes the pressure off each individual piece of music. It allows you to remain in an, more of an experimental uh, mindset. I don't, I don't mean fully experimental, but, but just a bit more relaxed um, about things. Yeah, you just chill on. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, just like that you're still having fun when you're finishing things. It, it increases the, you know, for those who've done the idea explosion challenge, if you can extend the tendrils of your splurge mindset further and further through the process, just good things happen. Trust me, the, the quality goes up, you make more music, it goes quicker. Yeah, but it does, again, I don't know if you remember me saying, but the reason I obviously teach the, the splurge mindset in idea generation is because it's a great way to start ideas, but also because it's much easier to do then. But you can still do it at the end, as shown by, you know, I mean, the live streams that I'm doing is like I'm literally splurging and finishing something at the same time. I mean, I'm not, fin I'm not mastering it, obviously, but I'm actually finishing it at the same time. That's the sort of end point of the of the kind of splurge mindset we're just making making the thing and that's the thing yeah i mean you don't ever have to get to that end point you don't have to do you know music live or anything like that but um it you know it's that's that's the the, the point of this i think a healthy creative process is one that is free flowing and when it isn't free flowing you know what to do uh, next and this kind of thing helps now because every creative process has struggled that it that is the point almost it's not that we are removing the struggle completely because this isn't a magic button yeah but it's like when i do struggle i know what to do that's the point of this kind of uh, roadmap of the creative process um so oh, oh sorry that's wrong um in a minute Yes. Somebody asked if this would be available as a PDF. Uh, yeah, I can I can make it available as a PDF. Uh, yeah, what I'll do is I will. What will I do? I'll export it and I will put it in the Momentum Monday uh, program, uh, which people can sign. Momentum Monday is a free a free coaching uh, uh, sessions that we do every week, like this, uh, basically. Um, which is relaunching soon. We had a little uh, hiatus and I wasn't sure if I was going to do it, uh, keep doing it, but we are going to uh, keep doing it. So what I'll do is I'll put it in there and you can sign up for that's completely free. You can sign up for that in uh, the, there's a link in the description. I think it's momentummonday.live or something. It'll take you to a landing page. Um, and we, we, uh, we do these kinds of uh, coaching sessions uh, every week. Okay. Then, Obviously, in done, what you're doing now is you are basically preparing it for release. Yeah. So some of the music that gets into done, you decide, actually, I don't want to release this, right? in which case it goes to the sketchbook. That's not a waste of time. It's not a problem. It's all good. It's part of the process. But some of it you do want to release. Now, I think everybody's very familiar with the kind of things that you do in done. I don't think I need to need to explain to you <laughs> what you would be doing because just go on YouTube and see the majority of tutorials on there. That's the kind of thing that you do in done, <laughs> which is like, you know, mixing and mastering and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And eventually it will get to the point where it is uh, release ready. Yeah. Now it being release ready is not ever going to be and if, and if you do think it is, then you're not listening hard enough, right? But if, it's not ever going to be that I am 100% satisfied with this piece of music. And, and as I said, if you think that you are 100% satisfi satisfied with it, then you're not listening hard enough. Why might I be saying that? Why might I be saying that, Arash? Sorry, I was typing. Oh, okay, you that? Luke, what, did, did, you, what, did, you, did you hear what I said? I was typing, I was it. Okay, was so it. you're answering questions, right. Le, le, yeah, so the reason I'm saying that is absolutely fine. It's a good thing for you to be doing. So the reason I'm saying that if you think that you are 100% satisfied with a piece of music that you are finished, that you are not listening hard enough, is that every single piece of music can be improved that has ever been written. Yeah, even your favorite piece of music that's ever been written by the greatest composer of all time they can be improved. It is not the case that there is a perfect piece of music out there, and it is not the case that you will ever write one. So if you are 100% satisfied with your music, you are not listening hard enough. So what does that mean? 
Well, that means that we have to understand that release ready does not mean perfect. What it means is that you have got to a point where you're not learning. Th it's like you're not learning anything or you're more likely to ruin it more than you are to improve it. Yeah, that it's actually done its job in or, or that you have delivered the purpose, delivered on the purpose. Delivering on the purpose doesn't mean it's perfect. Delivering on the purpose, I mean, because it can't be, because it can always be improved, right? So, I mean, this is something that's really, really important to understand. Everything that I do in my life operates on the base assumption that it can be improved, yeah? That errors are unavoidable, and errors are how we learn. Errors are how we progress, because we fix them. Right? So you don't stop doing the thing because it's not perfect, because then you don't do anything. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that's a really, really important thing to understand about releasing music. If you are 100% satisfied with anything you'll make, then you're not listening hard enough. And the, so therefore, the goal is not to be satisfied with your releases. It is for it to get to a point at which it is delivered on the purpose. You have learned something. Or you go in nowhere, you go around in circles. Yeah. So, um, what am I doing now? We're right over here. So, what I've just shared with you there is the, the basic structure the uh, automatic music machine is uh, based upon. And I'm just going to show you my automatic uh, music machine. If it comes up, right, there we go. Trello's been playing it. So this is where we track our pieces of music. Yeah, and this is one of the things that I show you in, the, in uh, the, the leap, which is how to use this. This is Trello, by the way, uh, before anyone asks. So uh, how to use Trello to, to kind of run uh, the machine. So here you can see I've got ideas and in ideas it's just really a notepad and just general like random ideas that I've, that I've got song titles some ideas I've got from listening to podcasts song exploder podcasts I've even got a checklist there, a streaming checklist in there you know different processes that I'm coming up with and stuff sketchbook is where all of the music that I've ever you know all of the ideas that I've made when splurging live this is my split I need to listen to these splurges <laughs> I'm letting them uh, build up. I haven't listened to some of these for, for absolutely uh, ages. This is my Discover channel, my, Disco my Draft channel, and here is my uh, Done uh, channel. Now, this has changed quite a bit because recently I've gone from making tracks to making albums, so it's all a bit bleh, um, at the moment. So I haven't got anything in uh, release because I'm releasing it all <laughs> at the moment. So these are the three tracks that I've released so far. Yeah. And as you can see, there's lots of different labels going on here. So there's, you know, listen and bookmark and uh, uh, everything like that. But each, essentially, each of these cards is another track, or in these cases, actually, another album. Okay. And um, essentially, you can see in here, we're making checklists and, and uh, stuff like that. I mean, I hate the word checklist, right? But if you can separate your editor out of the creative process and start actually um, deciding what to do before you go into the creative process, that gives you a lot more freedom to, for the magic to happen, essentially. Yeah? Because you have, a, again, a roadmap for what you're going to try or what you're going to do in the creative process. You do it, and if you sort of lose yourself, you can always come back to the list. So I'm not a big fan of lists you know, in general, but they're so, so helpful when you're making music because it's so easy to mess yourself up. Okay. So as you can see here, we've got splurge, discover, draft, done, uh, release, yeah, and then uh, released. Now, the reason things aren't in release, as I said, is because I'm releasing, I'm a bit behind the ball to say the least. Um, so I'm releasing things like sort of immediately. So there's nothing building up in here. But, you know, for the next idea explosion challenge uh, competition, which will be in three months time, I'm hoping there'll be a nice 
long list of things that are, are basically ready to uh, release in here. Okay, so moving on. Coming up is why I know that right now is the best time to be making a bunch of quality music as I've uh, promised. But what I'm going to do first quickly, because I know there are a few people who are asking, is I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of what's in uh, the leap because the leap is where I teach the automatic or we teach me our Ash and uh, Luke we teach the automatic music machine so um, essentially and it's going to be super quick this isn't going to be a massive pitch fest or anything it's like literally I'm just going to show you what it is okay so bear with me if you're not interested in it it's totally fine if you're not okay so the leap essentially you start you join and welcome and then there's a bunch there's a bunch of stuff for you to do just to get started yeah uh, with each um, chapter you get a workbook with all of the stuff in it as well but I do recommend please please watch the videos yeah just do it <laughs> because because all of the all of the question all of the questions are answered as well as that there are weekly coaching calls yeah, with me, Luke, and uh, our Ash. And what we do on the coaching calls is different to what we, we, we've been doing, is that we actually do workshop exercises. So I run you through uh, different exercises. So there's one of those every week. Yeah? And bear in mind that when you join the leap, you're in for life. So you can do as many classes as you want, and there are four a, a, a year. Yeah? So that basically means that you get like over 40 coaching calls with workshop exercises like, for as long as you want. Yeah? Then, essentially, the first... Seven weeks, week zero, week one, week two, week three, week four, uh, week five and week six are where I teach you the automatic music machine. And we go through the different phases, the discovery phase, the drafting phase. Um, I let you keep the machine running there to get used to it. The release phase and then the another one on actually uh, 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 releasing. But how I have actually designed this is that you are making a specific music project. So it's not just a bunch of content. I'm actually getting you to do specific things in order to finish a music project. Yeah. And then finally, and we'll come to what this is, but in finally in the week seven and eight, we talk about the business stuff and the magnet model. Because what I'm getting helping people do is build magnet model businesses, which are music businesses which are not dependent on touring. And by the way, I was doing this way before any crisis hit, any pandemic hit. Yeah, I was telling people that the, the, you know, the music touring businesses aren't sustainable like years ago. Um, so this has come from uh, that. So the last two weeks, I'll show you how all of this music you're making can build a, um, a uh, secure and stable business not dependent on touring of course you can still tour when the gigs come back but it's not dependent on touring for it to uh, actually work and as i said you get all these coaching calls there's a little gift there which i won't tell you about uh, now uh, you get coaching calls there's also um oh god i haven't shown no, i've just been going through this and i haven't shown you the thing so here's the here's the actual course yeah so welcome material, coaching calls, and here are the, sorry, I didn't realize I wasn't sharing my screen. You get a workbook, yep, yeah, and, oh. So essentially, week zero. Sorry. Oh so yeah. So week week zero. It's getting ready, and in the first six weeks, it's learning the automatic music machine, and then down here, it's the magnet model where we are learning the creative process. Here you can see the dates, yeah, and all of the coaching calls. And if you're wondering why there are two dates, it's because of Australia. We're in the future here. Okay. So so. That's essentially uh, the course. The other thing that you um, get, though, is also, where is it? Let's see if I can find it. Maybe I haven't got it here. Um, you also get the Leap Library, which is um, absolutely uh, loads of additional uh, information as well. On top of that, 
it's like extra training and stuff like that. On top of that, you get access to a, uh, a Slack community. Yeah, and Slack is different to Discord in that it's a lot more organized. Like Discord's a bit chaotic, whereas in Slack you get loads of, you know, you can do uh, threads and, and things like that. So you can, it's like we can keep up with it much better. And you get assigned to you either Luke or Arash who will follow up with you every week in, the, uh, in this uh, Slack community, making sure that you've done it. You get that the first time through, yeah, because you can do it as many times um, as you want. Here you can see everyone's uh, success happening here. I won't kind of uh, zero in, in, in on any of it, but you can see, um, you know, and your when you're making your music project, you're posting the stuff that you have done in here. So you're getting that kind of accountability going as well. And obviously we're always in here answering uh, uh, your uh, questions as well. So that is essentially uh, the leap. Sorry, I wasn't showing my screen there. I thought I was showing you the actual course and I was just showing you a slide. So that was a bit idiotic of me, but never mind. Um, I do actually have a name for myself uh, with my team, which is I call I, I am the idiot. Um, so there's the, the, the idiot at the top of this, uh, at the top of this organization. Um, so, and by, and by the way, the link's in the description for uh, finding out more about uh, the leap. Uh, you can also send me an email at mike at makemusicyourlife.com if you want to ask any other questions. But the question, obviously, on everyone's mind is why bother? Why bother doing this? Because the leap is about taking the leap. It's about whether you do actually want to take the leap to, be, you know, to making music your life. And making music your life can be many things. It doesn't have to be full time. It, it can simply be like that you have a side hustle where you're making music and you've got a little income coming from there. Or maybe it's not even in, an, an income. Maybe it's just something that you are doing for the love of it, but you are actually getting your music out. That's cool too. But the thing is, even in that situation, it has to bring some money in in order for it to be sort of a valid thing to do. Otherwise, it's going to become extremely expensive, <laughs> right? Yeah. Wouldn't it be great to have a hobby that kind of pays for itself? Yeah. But why, why bother? Yeah. Beyond uh, loving making music, of course. So isn't the music industry dead in the water? Well, it kind of is in a sense. But you know that phrase, the king is dead, long live the king. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah, because two major ways the crisis has changed the industry, and we've already kind of referred to this a bit, which are the pandemic has been the great accelerator, and it's also been the great leveler. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, the great accel accelerator is that, to be honest with you, the music industry was already broken. I mean, I love gigs, don't get me wrong. I love touring. I did it for like 10 years all over the world as a DJ. I loved it. But I can promise you that as a business, touring gigs, it's not secure or sustainable. Why? Because it requires for you to be present to deliver the value. Even people who are making absolutely loads of cash, or were making loads of cash from doing massive gigs, if they have to be present to deliver the value, what happens when they can't make it? What happens if they get ill? What happens if something ha I mean, what happens if the there's so many different things that mean that they're on very, very shaky ground? Again, I love gigs. I love touring. I'm not anti-gigs. I'm not anti-touring. I'm simply talking about building secure and stable businesses that musicians can rely on, that musicians, that, that enhances their creativity, that doesn't suck the life out of their creativity. I'm just going to shut the window. These birds are going crazy out there. Yep. Um, because one of the things I found from touring is that it's absolutely exhausting. And I don't want to be like a DJ complaining type person, but it's utterly exhausting. It's really, really stressful. It's really bad for your health. You know, jumping on planes, you know, and, and constantly, yeah? It, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to say no to some gigs rather than have to say yes because you need that cash, yeah? So any business that requires you to be present 
in order to deliver the value. And that's where all of the money comes from. Most of the money comes from, not all the money, but most of the money comes from, yeah, it is not secure and it is not stable because it requires you to be present. As the crisis of COVID has, all, has shown us, yeah? And as I've been te teaching for literally years before the current crisis, when was it that I started jumping up and down about this, Luke? Do you remember? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I think it was like, I think it was BC. Was it like 100, 200 BC? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> So, I mean, you see, the, the thing is... It was 2016, the, I think. Yeah, yeah, the, I think it was 2016. Yeah, so the reason, the reason that I've been jumping up and down about it for so long is because I experienced it myself. It was like, it was so harsh. It was such a harsh situation. I basically, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I gave up uh, music was because of this problem. It was like I had a child and I, our first uh, boy... And it was like, I didn't want to do that anymore. And it was killing me. I mean, it really was. I was massively uh, overweight. I was sad. I was angry all the time. I was in a state. And yes, I'm sure I could have done it better. I mean, I do take some of the responsibility for that. But it, it's just, it was a very, very uh, unpleasant situation. Having your creative process so pressured on touring as well, it's like you have to deliver you know as a as a, an independent artist you have to deliver certain music and what happens if you have moved on but you've been booked to play these gigs it's not it's it, it's not very pretty which is why i've been teaching this for years and one of the problems i wanted to solve was how does a musician build a business which isn't reliant on touring because when i started making music the scalable item the recording was the big money maker and the the non-scalable item, the gig, promoted the recording. That flipped when the internet came along, where now the, the uh, recording, the scalable item, which is virtually worthless in terms of money, promotes the non-scalable item, <laughs> the touring, which is totally unsustainable. I mean, people do do it, but it's, when I say sustainable, it's not healthy and you don't know what's going to happen, right? So in this context, you'll understand why I was utterly gobsmacked at my first ever music producer meetup. So I went to a thing because I moved here to the Sunshine Coast not, uh, just after the, the pandemic hit when the walls came down, the, 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 uh, we were allowed to go somewhere uh we we moved up here to uh, the sunshine coast i thought i'm just gonna go and meet a few people and so i went to a, a local music producer meetup really cool really cool people um and the guest was a, a fairly successful australian artist you know kind of i don't know he's like five million plays on spotify that, that you know that that kind of area uh, of uh, success and he was great he was absolutely brilliant loved what he had to say i i, I thought he was yeah, I just really, really impressed. Lovely, lovely guy. Got nothing bad, uh, bad to say about him. Um, but I was utterly shocked because I asked him a. I, I was shocked by an answer to to a question that I asked him because I should we did a Q and A thing, and this was my question: What's your manager's plan given the crisis? Because obviously he was in Amer he was in America when when uh, the pandemic hit, and then he had to fly over here, and obviously his tour was cancelled. And blah, blah, blah. so I said, Well, what's your manager's plan given the uh, crisis and this was his answer and by the way i'm paraphrasing here because i i didn't record it or anything right but it was something like this they don't have one <laughs> some are optimistic things will get back to normal soon i'm not so sure now bear in mind this was a few months ago now this was about six months ago <laughs> but okay so the, i was like i actually was i got angry yeah i actually got angry i mean i didn't say i didn't say anything i obviously kept my mouth shut it wasn't, wasn't my place to say anything right but i was like they don't have a plan they're just waiting for things to get back to normal right because yes gigs are coming back at some point no doubt at some point this is going to be over yeah the the crisis is going to be a distant memory hooray right but think about it his management the people who are supposed to be looking after him are waiting for things to get back to being unsustainable and insecure 
when the crisis has made it crystal clear that they are insecure and unsustainable. I mean, really? <laughs> are you kidding me? Right? And if you think about the touring model, which is the basis of the music industry for, for independent artists, or it has been, I, w I want you to think about this. Aside from small gigs, what else has to exist to make the touring model viable at all for independent artists to make a living? Post your guesses in the chat. Aside from small gigs, what else has to exist to make this model viable at all for independent artists to make a living? Any, any ideas, Luke or Arash? Wait, actually, maybe you already know. <laughs> yeah, too right. I am getting mad. I'm really mad. I'm I, like, I'm, I was, I was incensed, <laughs> to be honest. Not at this guy, not this guy at all. It's not, not his job to be thinking about this. Okay. Yeah, some people put their suggestions in. Colin says, internet. Spencer, only fans. So we, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm talking about the touring model, the touring model. Yeah, the, the, the thing that the, the, the past music industry has been based upon. A big advance, yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> uh, the touring model, because people are saying merch. No, for people, right, so people, the vast majority of independent, I think probably almost all independent music, uh, yeah, musicians, artists, were making probably the majority of their income from touring. In order for touring, touring to do that, what has to exist? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you out of your misery, right? In order to make that a viable model where that's where the money comes from. Yeah, because bear in mind, the, the, the manager that this guy was talking about or the agent, right, were waiting for touring to come back. Yeah, that's their own, that's, that seems to be their only thing in their, you know, not the only thing, but it's, it's like the major thing that they're thinking about. Yeah. In order for touring to be a viable business model for independent artists, there need to be big festivals and big gigs. I can tell you right now that the only way that I made it to America was a couple of big gigs and then the rest of the gigs were basically paid a lot less. Yet that got me there, the big festivals and the big gigs, and then I did a tour around. Without those big festivals and big gigs, it wasn't possible. Yeah, I wasn't making any money, the agent wasn't making any money, right? And it, it just wasn't doable. You need the big festivals and the big gigs for the touring to work for an independent artist. I'm not talking about massive artists. I'm not talking about major label artists. That's a different story. I'm talking about, I'm talking about independent artists. Yeah? The big festivals, the big gigs make, tour, make the touring model work. They are a fundamental element of it. The second thing that needs to exist in order for the touring business model to work. Can anyone tell me when huge gatherings and cheap air travel, if you didn't see that last slide when I exploded, Cheap air travel is what it said. Can anyone tell me? Does anybody, can anyone look into the future and tell me when huge gatherings and cheap air travel are going to be as common as they were pre-crisis? Can anybody please tell me that? No. I mean, we don't know, do we? We don't know when that's going to happen. I mean, I don't know. Two years? Five years. I mean, maybe huge gatherings will come back before that. I, I don't know. But cheap air travel, I don't know. Right. So I'm not surprised that artists are saying, what's the point? When the people that are supposed to be looking out for them are waiting. I'm going to say it again. 
What the? Beep. Right? Can you see why I'm so angry about this? <laughs> it, right? But let's think about waiting. Now, I'm going to stop being angry now. I'm going to start being positive again. Right? So let's think about waiting. Just the whole idea of waiting at a time like this, which is what a lot of people do. Because, as I said, the pandemic has accelerated what was already the case, which is the unsustainability of, of the music, the vast majority of the music business. Yeah, so it's just accelerated the, the, that being obvious, right? And so people are kind of left wondering what on earth to do. Yeah, but the other thing is it's been a great leveler. And, and when I say let's be positive, I'm not happy that this has happened, but there is something positive to take from it, given that it has happened, right? So what once was an incredibly crowded space is now wide open because nobody, virtually no one knows what they're doing virtually. I was quite proud of that one, actually. Virtually no one knows what they're doing virtually. In other words, no one knows what they're doing online in the music business anyway. Yeah. In like the business I'm building around here, like we have worked it out, <laughs> right? But like in, in terms of the music industry, because it was so based upon events and touring and you know actual physical things, they just haven't figured it out. Yeah. So it's very very few people know what they're doing online in the music business. I mean, there are people who do, of course there are, but not many compared to so for instance in coaching, which is another sort of industry where they've got it figured out, yeah? And most artists are simply waiting for touring to come back because that's all that they're being told that they can do, right? Despite my hardest efforts, they're still waiting, which means that right now is literally the opportunity of my lifetime, yeah? Because I want to help as many musicians as I can. Create secure and stable businesses that aren't dependent on touring. Again, I'm not anti-gigs. I'm not anti-touring. I just don't want it to be a ha I have to do this gig. I mean, you, you toured for many years, or, uh, well, quite a few years. I know many is a relative term, isn't it, Luke? But Luke, you, you toured for, for quite a few years. I mean, how did you find the experience of touring? <laughs> like 99% terrible. Maybe not 99%. And then, like, most of the time, like, just not fun at all. <laughs> or, like, I'd almost rather be working, like, a job than doing it a lot of the time. Just because you're like, I got to drive five hours, and I'm exhausted, and I got no sleep, and I had to move a bunch of stuff. Um, and there were, like, eight people there last night. And there'll be, you know, there'll be, like, really great points. It's not like the whole thing is bad, but it is, like, a lot of... Um, and it just alters like your entire life, you know, just everything about your life. If you're trying to do it regularly, it has to kind of shift because you have to be like, you know, gone often. Um, yeah. So all your friends, basically, when they're off, you're working. And when they're at work, you're off. So that's one one thing that, that happens. It's like people stop inviting you to things, not because they hate you, but just because you're never there. So they don't think you're available. Um, and I mean th that's just one of that's just 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 one of the things. I'm not I'm not complaining. I was very very grateful to have had the opportunity to do it, but the the it's not that doing gigs is a problem. It's having to do every gig is a problem, right? You could ch if you could choose to do particular gigs, then that's great, yeah. But having to do every single one that's the problem. You need other sources of uh, income, yeah? So that's what I'm looking to help uh, people do. Create secure and stable businesses, not dependent on touring with what I call magnet model businesses. And as I said, the magnet model is what I share in the last two weeks of uh, The Leap. Because, I mean, I really do think this could be st the start of the new music industry because when things are destroyed, yeah, it's kind of, an, it's, a, it's a cycle of nature, isn't it? You know, we get the uh, bushfires, here, some of which are started by humans, but even if they weren't started by humans, they still have bushfires. Because what happens is it, it burns out, which then essentially fertilizes the ground for new shoots to grow. It is kind of unfortunately, and it's very painful and terrible, and I, you know, I feel terrible about it. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not cheering it on. But it creates fertile ground for a new thing to grow. 
So this could be the start of the new music industry that we are in right now. A music industry which bypasses middle people because artists connect with their fans directly and are paid fairly by them. Yeah. They're paid because they're giving them what they want. Aren't we are giving their fans what they want, which is our unique music. Another thing that has happened as a result of the way the music industry worked before is that it has created an enormous uh, incentive to make hits like the last one. Because it's based on massive audiences. Right, think about it. If you're... If your business is dependent on streaming and touring, in terms of the streaming, it's all about massive numbers. If it's all about massive numbers, then the incentive is to create a hit that gets massive numbers. How, where have you seen massive numbers before? From a previous hit. So therefore, you are now incentivized to do, to, to do the same thing as that has happened before. It has strangled the creativity that is happening in music itself, right? Massive numbers is a, you know, if that is a requirement to even make this work even vaguely, our creativity is going to be strangled because we have to, it's, it's like, I mean, I've worked with um, some sort of pop type artists who are major labels and trying to help them it's almost impossible as a coach because they actually, they, it's almost like they have to make their music in a, uh, it, it's like, uh, what's the word? Essentially, there's a bunch of people who are making the decisions. It's not just them making the decisions. By committee, that's it. They're making music by committee. There's the A&R man, there's the A&R man's dog, there's, you know, you know uh, the bloke who makes the tea, there's like all of these, the lawyer, the accountant, they've all got to say, you know, because oh, the numbers weren't good last time. So, you know, and, and it's just an absolute nightmare. And you've got all of these people who are scared because their jobs rely on them getting massive numbers, not just the artists, but the A&R people as well. So as a result, the music itself is more vanilla. Whereas if you can think of these smaller um are smaller in terms of numbers, but bigger in terms of actual revenue because they're actually delivering music to specific people who are then paying them in at return for various different ways. You could see how that's actually going to increase the creativity, right? Because you're not relying on big, huge numbers, yeah? And this, this kind of vision of a new music industry is why I'm doing this. It's why I made the leap. It's why I came back to making music. It's why I'm talking to you now. Um, and if you know none of that has made sense uh, to you, I don't know if you've heard of the phrase "buy low and sell high." Now I'm no investor, but you know when 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 the market is down, most people are selling, yeah? but the real smart people are buying. When everyone else is waiting. It's time for the builders to build. It's time for the creators to create, okay? If you are a builder, if you are a creator, if you're not content to wait for things to get back to normal, normal being insecure and unsustainable, by the way, if you are not content to wait for that, if you wanna do something with the lemons that we have been delivered. <laughs> and they are lemons and they are very bitter. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Then we're going to have to do something. Someone's going to have to do something. We're going to have to make waves. We're going to have to start showing that this is possible. Yeah. But bear in mind, this isn't going to be easy. I'm not suggesting this is a magic button that you can hit. And it all, you know, immediately happen. I mean, I, I show you the magnet model in two weeks in the leap, but you're not going to build magnet model businesses in two weeks. Nothing like it. But I'm showing you how it's possible there. But it's not easy. It's got, I mean, it's like building this business, the coaching business, is one of the hardest things I have ever done. But we don't do this because it's easy. We do it because it's hard. 
We do it because we have to. Because what's the alternative? The alternative is waiting for things to get back to being unsustainable and insecure. And I ain't willing to do that. I've, I, I, you, I've had too many conversations with people who have been essentially just left uh, behind because of this uh, pandemic. Again, me saying that this is the biggest opportunity in my lifetime is not me cheering that this has happened. It's my response to how terrible this is and how strongly I feel that musicians have been uh, left behind by the, in the industry as a whole. And I don't blame anyone in particular. I don't think there's a bunch of bad actors or there's some, some kind of conspiracy you know, of people who work at Spotify. And I just, I don't, I, that's not how I see it. It's just that there has been a succession of events and situations which has meant that musicians have really been left behind. And our music and our culture and our society is poorer for it. So, Soapbox steps off. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, all, the, all that's really left for me to, to uh, say is what we're basically doing in order to help you do this, right? Because it's not just the leap. Of course, the leap is, is, is happening. It's not just the leap. I, I know the leap is a big commitment um, and not everybody can do that. And that's absolutely fine. Right. But this is a this is a, I don't have investors. Make Music Your Life doesn't have investors because, again, the incentives are all wrong there. For this kind of a business. Right. So it is, a you know, in order to actually do what I'm uh, talking about, we need to we need to make money. So so we do sell things. Yeah. But not everything that we do is for money. So here's what we're doing. Yeah. Which isn't for money. <laughs> yeah. Weekly Momentum Monday sessions. And next week, with the relaunch, we're going to do something slightly different than we really uh, uh, do usually. There's going to be a feedback party where we basically play some of the music from the last class of uh, The Leap and give feedback on it based, based upon a particular process called the Paths process, which I, you know, even if you're not actually having your music fed back on, because you're not, it weren't in the last leap class. You will find useful because you'll hear us actually talking about why this music, you know, how this music could be improved. Okay, so that's happening next Monday, and then after that, there will be weekly Momentum uh, Monday sessions. Okay, um, so that's completely free, and you can sign up with a link in the uh, description. I'm also building a mag. Oh, and also in the Momentum Monday sessions, we, me, Luke, and R. Ash will be sharing. Uh, our experiences of uh, you know building our magnet model businesses uh, from the ground up um, as well. So that's that's happening there too. But also I you know I'm doing more of uh, my own thing of building my own uh, magnet model business on the Mike Mondaly uh, channel. Again tomorrow there's a, a live stream there, and the Discord, the Make Music Your Life Discord, is open to Momentum Mondayers and Idea Explosionists. I've actually got to open it to Momentum Mondayers. This week, I haven't done that yet, but it's basically going to stay uh, open. So that's going to be a place where we continue to do stuff. And I will post, you know, the Momentum Monday uh, sessions and the live streams that I'm doing. We're going to sort it out much better so there's enough channels and everything like that. This is a new thing. We've, we've only just really launched the Discord, so it's all kind of uh, uh, new. So, so we're building um, that uh, as well. So all of that stuff is... Free. There's nothing. You don't need to pay anything. The, the, only, the only thing that we require is your time. But of course, we also have a leap class uh, starting on Friday, January the 29th. As you've seen, it's a 10-week boot camp style intensive training. For seven weeks, we go through the automatic music machine by completing a music project of your choosing. The last two weeks is the magnet uh, model. You get weekly coaching calls, Slack community. Either Luke or Arash is your coach following up with you personally on the community, and also the Leap Library, which is a massive resource. And bear in mind, you can do as many classes as you want. And some people do it, I don't, you know, I think uh, Son of a Preacher has done it as many times as we've done it. I can't remember how many times. Well, we were on the Leap 9, and then there were, I think there were four pilot ones, so maybe 13 times or something ridiculous uh, like that. So once a Leaper, always a Leaper. You're kind of, you're kind of in.
there. And I do understand that the leap is a commitment. I, I, I totally get it. But that's for a reason. In fact, that's for very, very, very many reasons. Okay. Some people aren't ready to start that commitment. That's absolutely fine, which is why we do all the free stuff. And, you know, if you're wondering if it's worth it, check the trust pilot reviews for why it's totally worth it. If you can make the commitment. Okay. So do we have any questions at this point? Is this going to stay up? Yes, I will leave. Uh, I will leave this this uh, recording up. Yeah. There were no no questions. Wow! Brilliant. Well, that was good. Uh, I, I I always love it when there aren't uh, questions, but then I always wonder, what did I do wrong? So there aren't any uh, uh, questions. Do you have any questions, Arash? Not at the <laughs> How about you, Luke? Uh, <laughs> I like this one. When are we going to take the world? Well, hopefully over the coming years. Uh, I mean, I really am in oh. this for the long for the for uh, for the long haul. Um, Reverbate asked if this is going to stay on YouTube. Yes, this one is going to stay on uh, uh, YouTube. Moteza asks, what do you think about the idea of putting music on Audio Jungle or Pond5? I don't actually know exactly what they are, but I presume those are services where they say they're going to put, like, put your music forward for sync or something, or, or, or some kind of royalty platform. They're like, they're like a place that if you were making a video, you could pay like $20 to have access to a license to use yeah, it okay. in your video. So it's, it's, it's like royalty-free uh, uh, music. It depends. If you, I don't know, because some of those places you have to pay, do you, you have to put your music on there? Is that right? Uh, I think I know. I've, I've actually looked into Audio Jungle a little bit, and I think they take a cut. And if you make it exclusive, okay. as in like you can't yeah. sell it anywhere else, yes. then right. So if you are not having to pay to put your music on there, and they are, you they get paid when you get paid. I think the incentives uh, make more sense. I mean, just bear in mind, I haven't looked deeply into uh, services like this, so please take this with a pinch of salt. But just an overarching principle, if you have to pay to put your music on a website on the off chance that somebody might use it, I, would, I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole. Because just think about the business model there is that, they don't actually have to do anything to make money. They just have to convince people that they're doing something. Now, I'm not saying that means that it's a scam. I'm not saying that. So please, let's not... Yeah, this Everyone kind of cries the word scam left, right and centre. And it's like, how many times have you actually been scammed? And most people go, well, uh, never. And so, yeah. So I'm not saying it's a scam. But what I am saying is the incentives are all messed up if you have to pay for that business. Because... The, their incentives are to get more people to put their music on their platform, right? And there's not that much accountability going on, right? So if you don't have to pay, then maybe there's no downside. I don't know. I haven't seen the terms. Yeah, uh, but if you do, I tend to I, I tend to swerve those ones uh, in general. I mean, to be honest with you, I'm focusing on building my audience and building a direct relationship with my fans because that's where I believe the biggest value is going to come being a magnet yeah it, it, for for people who want the kind of thing that i do um right. and if you like that it's almost like the opposite way around i'm not saying don't do it but what i'd like to uh, be able to do is to get to the stage where sync licensed people come to me where tv people come to me and ask me if they can use their piece of music on their latest show and that's why i'm focused on the, the other way, uh, kind of the other way around. Yeah. I think one thing to think about with the audio jungle is you're, if, if you're making tracks and you have like an overabundance of tracks, it can't really hurt like to put something on there. Um, I don't think, cause I've seen people make, definitely make money on it. I don't think you're going to like, uh, you know, change your life doing it. But if you have, if you like happen to write like a, a very like corporate sounding, rock piano track 
um, that a bunch of people are going to want to use in a YouTube video that you're not going to release, you could throw it up there, you know? But it's I don't think it should be, like, the focus of what you're doing, you know? Like, make the focus the, uh, the audience building. Um, and, yeah. and have, like, you know, it's kind of just like an extra side thing i think you know yeah yeah if you're looking if you're looking to some those sites to be like life-changing money i wouldn't i would your energies are better served elsewhere i mean again it might happen that that happens but it's like saying you know i you know is playing the lottery a uh you know a, i mean it's it's it, like it's, it's playing the lottery a good plan for sorting your life out <laughs> it's like uh no i mean this is the other thing about the old music industry is that the the the, the one that's dead in the water at the moment is that like largely it was based upon record labels throwing the dice with multiple artists and the ones that succeed winning like clearing up and everybody else uh, kind of failing yeah again which creates this kind of incentive towards the vanilla yeah incentive towards the lack of creativity and experimentation incentive towards the same thing yeah um, uh, over and over again um and and it, it, it kind of de de incentivizes people to make interesting music or do like really express themselves it's kind of a more of a fitting in thing yeah because it, 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 you know it required that that people roll the dice, you know, and, and the, the winners win. Yeah. But that kind of a, a, a model, I mean, it's, it's, it's now uh, uh, dead. And in general, if what you're doing requires that you have a hit, then you're probably not, do, you're, you're probably doing something wrong. It's not that we don't want hits, right? But it's like plan for, um, like expect, to have a hit, like what wants to have a hit, but don't ha don't make it a requirement for you to have success. And that's really what the uh, magnet magnet model is about. It's not that we're de-emphasizing, uh, you know, uh, promo or getting hits or or, or, or anything uh, like that. It's just that we're not requiring it in order for us to actually build a secure and stable uh, business. Because when you you know think about it like this, a a um, traditional music kind of business, artist music business, is based upon width, yeah, breadth, maximum number of people. Yeah? Whereas a magnet model business is based upon depth, the maximum level of engagement with the people that you have, right? The maximum amount of love. Yeah, we, we, we there's a there's a word that I made up called. Raving fangelists. We're looking for raving fangelists. We're, we're creating rave evangelists by delivering value to them. In that situation, you need a lot less people to actually make a lot more income, right? Because you're actually doing something which is of value to those people. Um, and the trouble is with uh, businesses which lie on breadth is they can often fall into this lottery like situation and I've got gone slightly off the, the, the point here in terms of audio jungle but again if you're thinking that those services are going to deliver you sort of a, a you know life changing amount of money it can happen but that's like thinking about the lottery yes he quite asked about the how to focus course Yes, I'm, I'm going to uh, sort that out this week. Don't worry. <laughs> Tons of people are asking about how many entries came into the challenge. <laughs> I haven't actually looked yet. I'm going to look today. I didn't even look. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit. I'm, I'm going to take a look immediately uh, after this. Yeah. Um, Bendu asks the cost of the leaf. Yeah, so it's, it's a significant uh, investment. Uh, up front, it's two hundred dollars a month for a year, or up front, it's two thousand uh, US dollars. Um, and yeah, I understand it's a significant commitment, but if you're wondering if it is worth it, because I know it's it likes it's, it's you, 
there's a fair amount of sticker shock that happens. But just go and check the links on uh, Trustpilot for the reviews to see whether it's worth it. Because um, I've got, you know, I've got no problem in saying that it's worth it. Um, I mean, right, think about it like this. Any business, and, and by the way, you're not going to be able to build a business like this by the end of the leap. This is about how to do it, right? The, the automatic music machine, you, like, if you follow the instructions and you do the stuff, you will be making a lot better, much better music in a lot less time. You can do that within seven weeks, particularly if, you have, if you've, had, uh, you know, you've done the Idea Explosion Challenge program and you've got results out of it. You definitely do that in seven weeks. Building a business is an entirely different matter. But put it like this, right? If you built a business that was bringing in 2,000 US dollars a month, a month, right? I would not say that that was a successful or secure and stable business, <laughs> right? So when you look at it in that context, $2,000 is like nothing. I mean, how much, go and have a look on uh, Berkeley online for, I don't know, it's almost like, how to, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm re, I, you know, I love, I, love, I love Berkeley and I think they're great. But, but if you compare it to the training that you get elsewhere, then it's, it's really uh, nothing. Um, and it, it, as I said, it is a commitment for a reason. Yes. Uh, uh, Senator Preacher asks, have you decided to do a live version of the leap yet? I haven't decided yet. Um, basically, at this point, no. So the leap nine is um, the leap nine is going to be as the leap uh, eight was, and then uh, the leap ten we're going to do an update. So I'm going to decide uh, then because I'm all, I'm constantly updating the program uh, as well. Sometimes little changes. So for instance, the last couple of leaps I've just ch I've been changing the coaching calls, been upgrading them a bit, um, and uh, but then occasion it's a bit like you know ableton or or logic or or, or whatever we, we we have a big update and it's time for a big update so uh, not this class but the next class the uh, the leap 10 there's going to be a um, a big update the leap x as i'm going to call it because x is the coolest letter <laughs> chris asks so it's 2000 a year but for that you're a leaper for life can you explain not 2000 a year 2000 up front and then you're a leaper of life for, for life yeah so so you get to join as many classes as you want so it's two hundred dollars a month for a year or two thousand dollars up front and that's it yeah and that's it and the first time you go through the leap you get coaches either luke or myself and then once your first round is over you can retake as many classes as you want after that so if you take the leap nine you can take the leap x you can take the leap 11 and you don't pay extra you just keep taking and you get access to all the updates you get access to all the calls still so that's how you're a leaper for life, but the payment for the course is a one-time thing. Yeah, yeah. So there's a payment plan of 12 months or an upfront payment. Yeah, the, the, yes. the, 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 those two options. But it doesn't go on. You, you don't. You don't. It's not two thousand dollars a year. Um, yeah. Yeah. Once you're done, you're done. Once you're done, you're done. Yeah. And you, you know, like we really do. You know, we really do get to know the people in the community. It's like it is a really, it's a close-knit community. I would say, and you, you know, we're. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I'm going to say that, aren't I? But it's like it, 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 you know, I start to, you know, you start to feel like they're. I mean, you do make friends, literally, because um, mm -hmm. you know this music thing can be quite a lonely thing. I mean, you know, both Luke and Arash here um, started out as uh, students of of mine, and you know, I probably spend more time with them than I do almost anyone who isn't my wife or my kids. <laughs> <laughs> God, my life right now. Let me God, tell you. Yeah, it's just, just imagine what a terrible uh, life they must have, having to listen to me bang on constantly. <laughs> and you know, another another thing to consider is what you're learning here is a skill you learn once, you learn it for life. Like we, Luke and I, have learned this. Gosh years ago, three, four years ago, and it's only compounded what we've been able to do over time. So it's, it's think about learning a skill set and how that skill set can help you in whatever you want to do in life. And I'll tell you, this practice that I've learned from the LEAP, 
I'm involved in multiple projects right now that require me to have a high output of material to present. I know how to do that. I'm not worried about, can I deliver? I'm like, I got 30 minutes. Cool. I'm going to pump out three ideas to send to the directors and let's see what they say. So uh, think about this um, as you're considering uh, whether or not to join the League Nine. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, uh, are there any other questions which uh, uh, aren't about the leap? I mean, you can ask questions about leap if you want, but aren't about leap because I really want to make don't want this to turn into just a constant uh, pitch fest. If anyone has any questions about the uh, magnet model or the automatic music machine, um, I don't want to, you know, I'm, I don't want to hide anything uh, from uh, people because I'm more than happy just to share any, you know. Uh, any information we can give you here for free, that's absolutely fine uh, with me. Because you know, my belief is that the people who want to do it will do it, and the people who don't want to do it won't do it. And, and it's like, I'm not like, oh, yes, and I'm going to give you, I'm not, yes. And the one, like, here's the final screw you need to make the, <laughs> the thing work, yeah? Um, because, you know, in Momentum Mondays, uh, we're, we're going to share, you know, loads, loads of stuff. It's just in, uh, in the leap, it's like, it's condensed. It's like this, you, you get the the whole banana in a specific amount of time, and it is an intense uh, process. But you get this real, real uh, training. Um, I not related to the lead, but Robin of Loopsley asks: In your experience, how many paying fans might you need these days to make music your life? <laughs> in my experience, how many paying fans? It depends how much they pay, doesn't it? It depends, uh, two, it depends on two things, uh, probably more than that, actually. It depends on how much you pay, they pay and how much you need, <laughs> so, right? So that, that's, those are the two questions you need to answer. Yeah, it's like, how much do I need? Which is a whole thing that you can go through yourself. And do I actually need all of this stuff that I'm paying for right now? That's one, one, one uh, side of it. Then on the other hand is, how much are they going to pay for what? Right, so what? So one of the things about the, the, the magnet model is that we have different, almost like levels, which people get can get um, engaged with you at. So obviously there's free, there's very cheap, there's recurring, and then there's expensive, right? And I mean, you can see it on something like Patreon, in, you know, uh, all the time, or often with uh, Kickstarter type things, where where uh, there are different kind of uh, levels. And I think the really smart people have a level which is really, really expensive. Because in any group of people, there are people who will actually get value. Do you know one of the one of the biggest insights I got about money in general is that actually buying things. I mean, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but actually buying things can be a pleasant experience. We, we like to buy things. Yeah. And it's actually a way in which we express our identity. So like buying a T-shirt, for instance, is often an identity statement. Right. So if you have a group of fans, there are going to be people who are going to get an enormous amount of value who want to pay you more money. Yeah. Now you have to create something which makes it worth it to them. I'm not saying you scam them out of a load of money and just ask for it. I'm saying you have to make something which really speaks to the thing that they want. Yeah, because then you can ask for a significant amount of money and they will be over the moon. They will thank you because you have given them an experience that they couldn't get anywhere else. Now, that to no. me sounds like a win-win, right? You are delivering enormous value. They are getting, a, 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 they are giving you a decent whack in order to get that value. Where's the problem there, right? People who tend to talk about, you know, uh, greed, you know, greedy this and greedy that. They don't understand how businesses work. They don't understand the money that goes out. They don't understand the the, the number of people that are involved in getting this stuff off the ground. So, 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 you know, you in a secure and stable business, you are going to have to figure out some things which are expensive. And if you are afraid of that, that's a psychological thing that you will have to work on as well. 
right? Because, I mean, it's something that I've had to work on. Like the, I mean, the first time I ever, because, you know, until I started this business, I had managers and agents who were asking other people to pay me lots of money. <laughs> so I had people in between me who were doing the dirty work, if you like. Yeah, but it was being art. You know, you need to pay uh, Mike, you know, five grand to play this gig or whatever. Right. I was too. I mean, I was too scared to do it. Yeah, I framed it as being not selling out. But I had someone doing it for me. <laughs> for God's sake. Like, so, hang on a minute. What, what, like, it doesn't make any sense, right? So, so when I started this business, and I didn't have a manager, manager and agent, and I had to ask people for money. You know, I had to I say, I'm going to do this. You know, it was, it was just one of the hardest things I've, I've ever done. And that is something that, you're, that, that you have to face. As I said, this is not easy. Yeah, it's, it, it's hard. But... I can guarantee that you can do it, no matter who you are. Anyone can do it. I'm sure of it. But you just have to get some of that crap in your head about money and value kind of sorted. Yeah. Um, I was answering a few questions. Some people are asking about the time. Good. Some people are asking questions about the leap again that's okay we can, uh, we, 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 can, we can still answer i just want to make sure that if anybody has questions which aren't about the leap who aren't interested in the leap are getting those questions answered as well that's that, that that's all yeah 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 um, oh sorry Didn't you sub by sub by sub by ask how much of your programs combine together at some point uh, well, okay, so so the so the leap is very different. I mean, they're all very they're all very different. So the idea explosion challenge is is you know splurging the the, the idea explosion uh, uh, challenge, um, where you just learn one uh, specific thing. Now, some people they do splurging and then that they're good they're good to go they're they're off Pew! yeah which is great. I'm absolutely over over the moon, but. There are an enormous number of improvements to be made by actually systematizing this enormous number of ideas you're doing, which is what the automatic music machine is about. And also understanding how a music business can work, I think is absolutely essential if you're serious about like making music your life in any way, right? which is what the leap is about. And it's a very specific training. You get the automatic music machine, you get the magnet model. Those are the two kind of model that things that you get yeah and then it's about practicing using them and getting better at using them so that you're building these businesses with the music uh, that you make and that's why the community is there that's why you can do it over and over again mission make music your life is more of a uh, long-term uh, thing where essentially because there's a lot of um, value in simply doing something every week it's a lot lower commitment and I give you specific things to do each week. I mean, it's hugely lower, uh, lower commitment. But I recognize a lot of people, you know, don't want to take that, take, make that commitment right now. Um, so there obviously, so in, in that you get different splurges and you, you get different um, exercises to do, some mindset ones, some business ones, a lot of music uh, ones. And it's almost like it's a kind of longer term thing. It's a lower commitment in terms of time. It's a lower commitment in terms of uh, money. It's kind of like a, a, a sort of much more of a, a slow burner thing. Um, so while and, and, and also in that context, because it's kind of a, a weekly thing, I can't teach you a... It's like I can't give you the magnet model. Or the, it, it just doesn't work like that. It's, it's, it's not that kind of thing. So that's, that's kind of a, a separate program as well. I mean, I've got a bunch of other programs that I no longer actually uh, uh, sell. We might kind of re-update kind of uh, update those and stuff. I've, I've done a, a load in the past. But those are the three programs. I mean, I've also got mastermind uh, groups. Uh, Luke and R. Ash also do um, coaching as well. Breakthrough coaching, we call it. Um, and there's also uh, one to one with me at various different, uh, and all of those things are various different uh, price points um, as well. But it's certainly in, in terms of the programs, 
the three programs are all very, very uh, different and kind of address different people at different points in their journey um, and, you know, kind of solve different problems. Really, the Mission Make Music Your Life thing is how do I stay consistent and what do I do in, you know, each week? Whereas the leap is here's how it works. Here's how you're going to make it work. <laughs> like here, like the, the, these two things, put those together and then obviously do the hard thing and consistently apply it and get better at it and practice it. That's how you're going to make it work. A lot of people are asking about the time commitment involved and like what what's going to be involved. Uh, the work, basically. Yes. Um, okay. So um, the... The amount of time that you need every day, studio time, I would say for the length of the program is half an hour a day, minimum, right? Now, you don't have to do, you don't ha well, it would be great. I mean, I show you how to uh, splurge every uh, day, even if you don't have that amount of time every day. But you don't have to have that time on a daily basis, it's just, so, so what is that? That's like uh, three and a half hours a week, right? Now, obviously more is better in the studio, but there's about an hour to an hour and a half worth of videos, which you can watch on fast, <laughs> right, each, each week. And then there is a coaching call as well, but the coaching calls are recorded, right? Um, and th the coaching calls go on for as long, like we're really diligent about trying to answer, I and mean, they don't always, because sometimes we have to go, but we're really di diligent about attempting to answer all of the questions. So they can go on for uh, you know, a long time, but that's from the Q&A. The workshop exercise is probably about maximum of an hour, um, I would think. So, and you can, obviously you can't, you can't put those on uh, high speed. Um, uh, so half an hour a day in the studio, an hour and a half, you know, uh, actually getting the actions because the content is about you doing actions, certainly in the automatic music machine part. It's not, you know, loads and loads of me just droning on about stuff. Uh, it's, it's literally me saying, do this, then this, these are your actions. Yeah. And then you go and do it. Now, more time is better, but because, I mean, this is one of the reasons that I get people to do, that I can say people can do it as many times as they want. I think sometimes people say, in order to get the value, I need to, I need to get it all this time. It's not possible because when you include the Leap Library, in fact, let me see if I can, just, if I can find the Leap Library for you so I can show it to you, um, which is totally optional, by the way, is a bunch of uh, content in there Come on, it's going really slowly. Okay, hang on. There's, I mean, there's more more uh, information in there than than kind of anyone. Where has it gone? The Leap Library. Here we go. I'm just going to share the screen in a second. Internet's going really slow. Preview all course lessons. Here we go. Yeah, so this is the Leap Library. So this isn't the main course. This is all optional. You don't have to do this. But again, you get access to this for as long as you as you want. So you can go, here's the welcome stuff. So there's the, the How to Focus course, which I'm going to give the Idea Explosion Challenge members. Uh, advanced Focus. Setup Mastery, which is about your gear. Build Bulletproof Creative Habits. And then Week Zero. Yeah. And then... Wait, one. So this is all extra stuff. Make great decisions fast. Stuff about how to make music, how to make better music, the thing. Um, arrangement stuff in week three here. Genre. Time. Yeah, so it's, a, it's like the, the Delete Library has a whole... I mean, there's multiple uh, uh, courses there. But so if you were to try and do all that in one go... You simply wouldn't bear in mind this isn't this isn't the actual program the actual program is 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 it's the core uh, program um but so if you're trying to do that all that in one go then you you just wouldn't be able to you wouldn't want to but that's why you get to do it multiple uh times because you're not going to get it all in one go but that's okay as long as you make progress the first time and then more progress the second time and then more pro yeah, look, 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 then look, look, like that that means 
that you're that you're making progress and you can do it with the help of us as as coaches kind of actually answering your questions in the community and helping you move forward i mean here you can see in the community that people are i mean i don't know how many people are releasing a track a week now but it's quite a few they're not support so that's the wrong one Yeah, track a week, second release of the year, third release of the year, track a week, track of the week, track a week, oh, there's me, track a week, <laughs> album week, yeah. So, so you can see that people, and you know, a lot of these people beforehand weren't making any music they weren't finishing any music i'm not saying all of them i don't know i can't i can't remember uh, but but i definitely know that some of the people that, that i just saw there weren't making any music at all and now they're releasing a track a week and in fact a couple of those people were actually in the last class yeah so not all of them are, are, are leapers who have come uh, over and over again they were actually in the last class so they're already and the last class finished when did the last class finish just before christmas right yes yeah so so they're 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 already releasing a track a week in 2021 as a result of the automatic music machine. Um, so, so the, the music part is, if, you, it, if it depends on your starting point, it depends what you do, it depends on how much time you have. But, if it, but the music part, part, you can get that sorted like that. And if, if you've had a great experience in the Idea Explosion Challenge program, that's a fairly good indication that you're gonna get a lot out of the leap. I, it's, you know, I can't guarantee anything, obviously, but. A lot of people have, I'm gonna say that, a few people have asked questions about the magnet model. And some people want like a little more explanation or what, uh, what's like a key thing about the magnet. Okay, fair enough. No, I, I totally understand that. It was really hard, as I said, it was really hard for me to cut this down because <laughs> I was like, oh, there's so much here. How do I? Uh... <laughs> I've, I think maybe I've bit, bit off more than I can chew with this uh, with this uh, presentation. Uh, so, so yeah, the oh sorry, I'll get rid of that. So the um, the magnet model essentially is about. In fact, I tell you what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop talking for a bit, and I'm going to get both Luke and Arash to. to explain you know to give some more back, sort of uh detail on what the magnet model is so luke why don't you start why don't, why don't you start because i think that that would probably be more valuable than me just banging on the whole time i think in its simpler form it's instead of like trying to make this grand opus statement that gets you a million fans overnight um you're trying to consistently put out things that will attract people towards you and it might be like um, it might be like 10 people at a time. So if I put out a track and I get 10 new fans, there are artists that would say that's a failure. Um, but for me, I'm like, if, if we're thinking magnet, it's like you're just consistently bringing people through the release of music. Um, and uh, it's like instead of, yeah, it's just like consistently doing things that will attract people towards you instead of trying to like, you know, drop a bomb over uh, over the entire music industry and get like ten thousand plays and or er, ten thousand plays, ten thousand fans like overnight. Um, did that summarize it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that, that that's great. How how about you, uh, uh, Arnash? How, how would you describe the uh, magnet model? The magnet model is creating a system where basically you have something to invite people to every week. Here's why it's important. When you look at people or artists that are, that you, artists that you look up to, artists that you admire, artists that are doing the thing that you want to be doing, for the most part, a lot of them are doing something fairly consistently, whether it's releasing music or live streaming, something in some capacity. The importance of this thing is basically helping you create a marketing tool, if you will, to always be bringing people in to see what you're about. 
Or let's say you're releasing a track a week and a new person comes across one of your tracks and they're like, oh, this is interesting. What else does this artist do? Let's say I come across Luke's track and I say, oh, this is dope. I, I look up Luke and I say, oh, he has more tracks. Oh, he live streams every week. I'm going to check that out. And then they just become more of a fan. And you are providing opportunities to bring people into what it is you're doing by consistently creating, by creating and consistently executing a flagship show or a model that magnetizes people to what you're doing. So it's a very important tool that every artist, uh, I don't want to say should have, but it's an important tool if you want to grow your fan base and keep your fan base with you instead of dropping one track a year and then waiting for the next thing to happen. In this day and age, people lose attention and you want to keep people engaged in what, what it is you're doing. Saying a lot, but that's what I think. Yes. And for huh. Very good. I was listening to that. I just uh, uh, needed to relieve myself. Uh, so I did turn the microphone off, I think. So <laughs> I think I've uh, failed to do that on some occasions, which is rather unfortunate. Anyway, so uh, uh, yeah, no, 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 absolutely. I think um, so the the what this is the antidote to is the bomb, which is what the, the music industry has been based on upon until uh, now in that it's like i'm doing this thing on this day or this thing is coming out on this day and in order for it to do well i have to have the maximum number of eyes on this thing otherwise it's not going to work right i need to launch this bomb and it needs to make a big splash and that's what all uh, pr rather than marketing is based upon and it's what the music industry is based upon. And it makes sense because the music industry, um, I mean, literally music was played, you know, was played in venues at a particular time, at a, a particular place. So that is like by definition, a, an event that happens. But also in terms of recordings, they used to be physical. And they used to be, have to be put in shops at a particular time. And they had to be displayed. It was almost like they had to do well in the first week. Otherwise, the shops wouldn't reorder. And then it would, they, they would die a death. Right? So all of that meant that the assumptions upon which the music industry is being based is event-based. Now, new. New release. New release. New, like it's, it's like, here's my new release. And it's got an, an infrequent new releases. Yeah. And they have to do really, really well. Otherwise, it's all been a waste of time. The magnet model is how the internet works. Right? Because that's not how the internet works. The magnet model is consistent, steady stream of releases that we do, you know, we do make efforts to get into the hands of the people who want it, to present it to them. But, but they don't need to be a hit because it's a steady stream of content, music, videos, whatever it might be, that over time magnetizes you. Because it's like a, it's like a flywheel. You just get a few people watching or listening, and then a few more people, listen, and then other people talk to their people, and gradually, over time, it grows into this thing. There was a video um, I can't remember, is it called Beast something on YouTube? And it was this wonderful, wonderful YouTube video. I mean, I don't know the guy, he's a YouTuber. And he's not a musician, but it's just this, this the same, same concept. So he's a YouTuber, and it was, it was a video from five years ago of him. He, he made a video, and he had like 60 subscribers on his YouTube channel or something. And he was about to do a, an exam at his... Uh, you know, he's at school still. He was just like spotty teenager kind of. And he was like, really crap video, just like going, oh God, I would really love it. I would really love it if I got to, I don't know, a million subscribers or something. I can't remember what, what he said. He said, oh, I wonder. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I wonder if I'm going to remember. I wonder if I'm going to remember what exam I had. And the reason he shot this video was what he said, he was going to shoot it, put it on YouTube, but schedule it for five years time. Right? So it just automatically came live in five years time. And it did 
And this guy has like, I mean, I don't know, like 80 million subscribers or something yeah. ridiculous, like five billions and billions. And he's like this massive YouTube uh, uh, star. And it's so wonderful to see because it's like this guy had 80 subscribers and simply by consistently making the thing which is valuable to his fans, he has built a business around it. And that's videos. Right? And I don't even know what kind of videos he does to be. I don't even know whether I like what videos he does. But this particular video is such a great example of it. Why can't musicians do this? What, what's the reason that we can't do that? Of course we can. It, the reason that we don't do it is because that's not how the music industry has worked. It's not how we've been told it should work. It's not how all the big artists we, that we know have made it work. But that's because they came up in the old music industry, which we've already established is broken. The king is dead. Long live the king. There we go. <laughs> the... French music has asked us a few times, so if you have, um, Mike, do you have any recommendations, books or podcasts about self-publishing books? About self... Publishing books? Self-publishing books? books? Oh, uh, well, uh, it's not really a podcast about self-publishing books, but Arash, you introduced me to, well, I mean, you didn't introduce me to Seth, but you certainly told me that he's got a podcast. Um, oh, yeah, yeah a, a Kimbo. And it's not really about self-publishing uh, books, but, you know, he's well known in that space and it is one of my favorite uh, podcasts. So Seth Godin's Akimbo. In general, listen to that podcast because he just like the whole everything that he says. It's yeah, I've learned a lot from from uh, Seth Godin. So so. Uh, and self-publishing book. I mean, I don't know about books, I, like books about self-publishing uh, books exactly. Um, mainly because I haven't self-published a book. So. Um, <coughs> Robin of Loopsley asked, no magic bullets, but seriously, is there an alternative strategy? And then I said, to what? And he said, to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out what he's what he's getting at. Um, so I don't know. Like, I don't yes. know. So, so I don't know um, when you say an alternative strategy to Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Um, I wouldn't call that a strategy. I would call that a set of yeah. platforms. So I don't know. I don't know what um, that means. Yeah, that's not a strategy. Any others? Yeah, it's, sorry, it's, I've got this blooming lawnmower. Uh, it might even be a leaf blower. If it's a leaf blower, I might go and shout at him. Leaf blower is literally the worst invention that humans have ever come with. Nuclear bomb, fine. Leaf blower, bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, obviously. No. So like, why would you blow leaves elsewhere? It's like, this isn't my problem anymore. <laughs> it's yours. Anyway, so yeah, don't get me started on leaf blowers. Thing out. Yeah. Mike Monday oh. saying nuclear bombs. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> These <flow> is bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't mean that, obviously. Uh, just to be clear. Uh, Gilberto Hernandez asks, when doing the leap, is it recommended to only be focused on that program during its span, or can it be paralyzed with other learning programs? Uh, you can do it. It depends what you're doing. So. Um, and it depends on the time uh, uh, commitment. Um, and it depends what they're teaching you. <laughs> so so, so uh, one of the things I will be teaching you, right, in the automatic, uh, with the automatic music machine is how to make your own music and not have to use reference tracks all the way through the process. Because I think reference tracks have a really uh, bad outcome. And I'm not saying you don't use references at any point, by the way. Uh, references can be useful in various different situations if used in the right way. Um, I would, uh, you know, I don't have anything bad to say about anyone doing the same thing as me because I think we're all trying to help people and we've got our own ways of doing things. Um, so I certainly don't want anyone to take that from this. But I believe that, that if you're doing a, a program, uh, a, a, certainly the creative side of it, you know, the, the music production side of it, which is saying, right, get a reference track, do this, da 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 you know, from the start, then you are in danger of going down a very bad path. I'm not saying you will, 
but I'm saying you're in danger of going down. A, it's got there's a lot, a lot of pitfalls. So one of the things I will be doing uh, in or we, or we we do do in the automatic music machine is essentially is how to actually be an artist and not have to rely on copying other people and that's it, <laughs> right? You do get inspired by other people. Yes, that's totally something, but you don't copy them, right? So if you're currently doing a course which is teaching you how to use reference tracks, I would recommend avoiding that while you're learning your automatic music machine. Um, but what would probably happen is that you'd probably end up not wanting to go back to using reference tracks because it's a lot more difficult, um, a lot more painful, um, a lot slower and a lot less effective. So, yeah, why would you go back to it? <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, but I mean, I think you, you could. You could do it. And bear in mind also that you could do it alongside other things depending on what you're learning. In the leap, I don't go into the technical details of, like, yeah, EQ and uh, uh, mixing and mastering. I do, I do, I do kind of, it, it's much more of a here's how to do Here's how to, I don't know how to describe, how would you describe, Luke, how would you describe how this is different from other courses, the, the, the creative part uh, of it? Um, it's kind of teaching you how to actual, well, it's like, it's kind of like the ant, it's, it's the, if I were going to take other courses, I'd want to take this course first. And then even after taking this course, it's like, I'm not sure if I want to take other courses after. Um, because it's kind of like a lot of times, if you're like taking a course, you're you kind of just like a bunch of like, inform you're thinking that information, it's just going to be like, a, like a, a like liquid pitcher of water. It's yeah. just going to be poured yeah. into your brain and then you'll walk away. Um, but with this, you realize like the way that you actually gain information and knowledge is, or the way that you gain knowledge is by actually doing the thing. Um, like there's a quote, it's better to be able to do something and not explain how than to be able to explain how something's done and not be able to do it. Um, and so this course is more like get it is giving you that in a very like real way where you're actually doing the thing and learning how versus like watching a course on how to do sound design and um and 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 then just being able to explain like the idea of an oscillator or explain the idea of what makes a mix good and not being able to actually yeah <clears throat> yeah exactly and i think i think Really, uh, what you get, what you get from the way that we do things over here, is that you get a, really a training in how to solve problems, and it is specifically related to the music production process. But people say all the time, "This has helped them in their job, in their relationships," and it's not because we're doing like you know uh, mindset stuff all the time and nothing else. You are finishing a project of music. That's what you are doing, but. Like it's like the difference between being given a fish and teaching you to fish. Except I would say that probably what I attempt to do is I'm not just teaching you to fish. I'm also teaching you about the sea, where the fish might be, uh, the best wood to use in order to build the boat, um, and how to think about fishing in general. And also when it gets difficult, how to overcome it being difficult when you are fishing. Right, so it's like it's like it's much more of a a, a sort of a all encompassing uh, uh, thing. So it's like. But then at the yeah, go on. Yeah, I was gonna say you're also like. You know the thing about the leap is you end up working on something and like you you come out of it with. It's like you're not just like teaching them how to fish. You're giving them a fishing pole and saying, by the end of this eight weeks, I need like you know pick a number of fish you want to catch, and and come back to me too. Yeah, you know, it's like exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You're you actually are actually fishing. fishing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like it's like you are actually doing the fishing in the course of it. And we're standing. I would like to take the analogy further. We're standing with you, you know, on the deck of this boat, going, "Oh, look, I think you need to," uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, that that kind of thing. Um, the there was a good question here from Robin. 
these days, always a bad start. Um, these days, uh, are there any other ways to get to the Magic 1000 or however many fans without doing endless promo content on social media, FB ads, Twitter? So I wouldn't put social media, FB ads and Twitter in the same bucket. I would say that advertising is different to the other two things that you uh, shared. But you don't need to do endless ads. If you find a good ad that works, then you can just do one. Uh, I was just saying to Luke the other day, I've been running the same ad for this business for the last five years. <laughs> um, it's starting to tire now, but I literally, I mean, I did it five years ago and and that's it. So it's not, it's end, I mean, what, endlessly, yes, I am endlessly paying Facebook money, but then I am endlessly getting people um, interested who will get value from what I'm doing. So, so that's one thing. The other thing is if, uh, Robin, if you go and look at my Mike Mondaly uh, channel, you will see, see me doing endless 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 posts on youtube but what am i doing on youtube i'm making music i'm performing i'm having the time of my life and oh god it's endless absolutely endless and i love it so maybe there needs to be some questioning going on in that mind of yours um about that kind of frame that you're putting around it. So yeah, so if you don't do advertising, but, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm doing what the way I'm doing it on uh, on YouTube because I mean I'm sure I will at some point do advertising, but I'm just showing that it, you don't need to do advertising. You just need to find the thing that you love to do and then to do it in public. Yeah, Robin said more. He said. Um... I don't know who he was responding to, but he said, underground radio is a good call. I'm just a bit worn out doing social media. It's very draining. I wish someone would turn it off. Yeah, I think I think you're, the reason is you're calling it doing social media. So, and, and, that, and that's the problem. Yeah. I'm not doing social media, I'm performing. And it happens to be on YouTube. So that's the difference. Okay, so we've been going almost three hours. Um, so it's probably time for us to and and also and maybe a bit of <laughs> and say uh, thank you everybody for uh, sticking with us uh, so long um, as I uh, as I uh, said uh, the leap is uh, coming we're, we're starting on the, whenever it is a week on Friday um, and obviously Momentum Mondays is happening I'm uh, streaming um, as well on my Mike Bond Daily channel. I will probably do one later on today because I think I'm going to, I think I'm, uh, yeah, I, well, I might be sending uh, some people an email um, a little bit in a, uh, in a little bit because I just want to find out a few things. So, so yeah, but, um, so yeah, I'll be streaming on my Mike Bond Daily channel tomorrow, as I said. Um, I will be talking literally about my music and how I'm doing, what I'm doing uh, and everything. So go and uh, check uh, that uh, link. If you have any questions at all, mike at makemusicyourlife.com. I will do my best to answer them. And of course, we will be uh, looking at any competition entries, reading your wonderful uh, answers to the questions and certainly listening to a bit of the music. I don't think we'll be able to uh, listen to all of it. And we will be announcing the uh, competition winner on, I can't remember the date. I think it was the, I, I don't want anyone to quote me on it. Anyway, it's by my f Friday, <laughs> okay? And it's Tuesday here at the moment. So um, I've got a lot of work to do because <laughs> I've also got to get another album out by Friday. So uh, yeah. Um, uh, so thanks for um, hanging out. It's been absolutely wonderful. We got, we got there in the end. Um, Luke, did you have anything extra you wanted to say? Uh, no, it's been a great little idea explosion challenge. It really has. And Arash? Congrats on finishing this idea explosion challenge, y'all. Uh, <laughs> yes. So uh, until we meet again <clears throat> this time next week, at the very least, I would think, um, as ever, onwards and upwards.